<laughs> Gorgira. Oh, big lizard. Godzilla. Mm. Like Blizzard. Um, the, 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 you know what it makes me think of every time is the fucking meme in a gold member. Austin Powers where they go to... And then the car <laughs> drives into like a Godzilla float. And then mm -hmm. all the all the people in the area are like screaming and running away from it. <laughs> it's Godzilla. <laughs> Hello. We're talking about Hi, everybody. Godzilla minus one. Which uh, we can even talk about why it might be named that. Uh, if Unless anyone has a quote from the director that can just be definitive. But I... Um, yeah. I was gonna say it's been we're a little late to this one, mainly because of the fact that it didn't come out on time everywhere. It came out like in different places, different positions, and then, and then I delayed seeing it even more because I was like, why would I go see it and then see it again when uh, when Metal comes over? As opposed to we can just go to the theater together to enjoy Big Lizard for the first time on the big screen. That we did. And I uh, I mentioned this on I think Real BBC, but I was I was quite I was like oh good for you Wales you you actually a lot of people came out to see it on New Year's Eve that's when we went to yeah. see it at exactly the start time was eight thirty p.m. I think so or forty forty five. So I, saw, for, um, I thought it was going to be like uh, more significant than that 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 it, I don't know at midnight or something that's when the film ends. Well yeah that would be around about that yeah. Would it be? Yeah I mean an hour off. Oh plus uh oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Plus, yeah. it's a movie theater, a modern movie theater. So, if a movie was to start minutes at say, like seven, you get was, twenty minutes of ads. I was about to say eight forty-five you know, plus the trailers. fucking half hour of ads plus two hour movie. Yeah, and it's credits. kind of like, funny. Away, that, um, I don't want to see the Blumhouse Bear movie. Fuck off. It is pretty funny <laughs> the notion it and that be done uh, with it. <laughs> if you know, it, like streaming services introducing ads is egregious, but when you pay like fifteen, twenty bucks to go see one movie, it's acceptable that there's twenty minutes of ads. Well, we complain about it usually every time. I don't know if we, that's considered acceptable. Yeah, but I, I guess it's more so that everybody complains, but nothing changes. You still get 20 minutes of ads. Isn't that what yeah. is happening on streaming, too? Everyone we've, complains? We've that's what I'm saying, is that people are getting mad ads. about it on streaming, like, more so than when you go to theaters. It's almost as if we bitch about it, but accept it as being part of life. That is the human condition. We do bitch about things mm. and then don't change it a little bit. What trailers did you get uh, for when you saw Godzilla? So Kung Fu Panda Four, which yeah, looked pretty really that one. Okay. looked a little cringe to be honest with you. Uh, um, yeah. And it, funnily enough, like there's always different see Aquafina lady taking over for Poe. No, and and just the enemy what? being like, look, it's all your favorite bad guys from history. I was like, oh yeah, fuck Thailand. off! Why? Why is everything like this? Well. <laughs> why? Uh, why can't? Uh... <laughs> well, you know, you know. But I was I, immediately uh, I like that. I think it was, uh, it's Night Swim, it's like a horror movie produced by, I think it's Bloomhouse and, uh, James Wan, so I'm sure that'll be we a really, get that one. really good horror it'll movie. It'll be really, yeah, The Bear, yeah, what's it called? Imaginary. There's an imaginary friend who's like a creepy, possessed bear or whatever, and it does spooky stuff, and instead of burning the bear, they j they ha make a movie about it. Oh. <laughs> isn't there a, uh, isn't there like a thing with Ryan Reynolds that's like... Like imaginary, isn't that a thing? Like a new a movie that's coming out, Ryan Reynolds with like imaginary friends, like big critters. What? And <laughs> no I, idea. I'm pretty. I'm pretty know. sure that's. I think that's something. I'm pretty sure I saw something for that. I didn't get a uh, trailer for that. Hmm. What? Well, oh damn! I can't remember what the other one was. There was one more. Oh, it was for the. It was fucking Godzilla Kong. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that was the other yeah, one. Too. Yeah. We got that. We got that. The other one was Godzilla Kong, which felt really funny. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, was, oh, I got um. That's funny. Got an ad for Argyle. Did oh, you guys yeah. get that one? Oh, that's we the, got that uh, too. That's yeah. the new Matthew Vaughn one, right? The, the yeah, one with the yeah. Cat. Uh, yeah, with the cat boy. That cat was present. Uh, yeah. So, yep. There. That's that's, that's uh, a Henry thing. Henry Cavill, right? Yep. And, Henry uh, Cavill's in it. So is Hemsworth. Rockwell? No, Hemsworth is in Furiosa. I got an ad for yeah, Furiosa. Rockwell. Oh, All right, I got an ad for Furiosa too. Yeah. We didn't get so, Furiosa. Um, Furiosa I, looks. Uh, f I can appreciate and I really enjoy the realness of Fury Road. All the real cars, real stunts, all the realness to it. And boy, mm -hmm. Furiosa looked fake as fuck. Everything looks CGI. Mm. Um, and also, Mad Max is no longer a part of his series. It is now well, a Furiosa I mean, movie. I guess it's kind of funny because they're not confident enough to let it stand on its own. So they yeah. got the, a Mad Max yeah. saga. What is that? Is that they have at the bottom there? Which 
I don't know. It feels a bit weird. <laughs> like the, you want to feel a little bit, 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 bit cocky. Max, a little bit but... cocky. It is cocky. I think it's cocky. It's, mm -hmm. You don't want to stand on your own two feet. You want to make sure that people know. Well, yeah, but this is Mad Max, which you've heard. Yeah, of. It, it's about mm -hmm. her. But 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 it's a Mad Max. You'll see it because of Mad Max, right? I, mean, I would have thought it would do okay know. as Furiosa, but I guess not. I thought it'd do like okay with just putting front and center the just George Miller again, like doing it as he as he made all of them. You know, like yeah. But I guess not. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. Wow, hmm. 2024, yeah, that's, uh, that's <laughs> a new year, well, a whole new I don't, set of I don't movies. think there are any other ads, but... Oh, well, no, to go no, back no, to no, um, Godzilla X Kong, which, what a name, mm. you know? Um, <laughs> I still Godzilla haven't seen X it, Kong by the way. New Empire. Uh, what, Godzilla vs. Kong, you mean? Yeah, I haven't seen the last... Oh, I haven't seen it either. I haven't, I haven't seen, seen it either. I, I... Oh, really? Oh, all right. Yeah, the <laughs> last one I saw was King of the Monsters. There's no way I was going to see Godzilla vs. Kong. We'll do an arc. It was for work we're purposes. Gonna we'll do an arc. We're going to see it going on. We have to, yeah, we're going to have to figure a list of which to include and which not, but of course, Long Kong will be entering that arena. Long Kong, absolutely. Well, as well as maybe OG uh, King Kong and OG That could be Godzilla. cool, OG boys, yeah. I, I would like to do that, yeah, because I think the original King Kong was like, we're talking 30s. 20s? 30s? I think it was the 30s, yeah. Uh, so that would be neat. Um, OG and Godzilla probably was, I think, the 50s. 50s, yeah, I think 54. Something like that. But, so, uh, uh, we'd that, be definitely keen on seeing that. That one shot see how in things particular. Change. Oh, the one shot of the two running. Oh, it looks so floopy. It looks so bad. <laughs> it <laughs> actually just makes me think of shitty floopy. Marvel. It's like, oh, yeah. there it is. Shitty Marvel. <laughs> and it's like, how, how is that what comes into my head now? It's like, I, I don't know. Godzilla see... runs like a, like a goober in that shot as well. Like it's because Godzilla's out, not like, designed like, to run. He's not meant to run. He's a giant. Yes, he's right. to, uh, yeah, if he's in the water, he's fast. When he when he's yeah. on land, he's like lumbering and menacing and mm. slow. Mm -hmm. But the problem is, it's like, well, yeah, we got Kong, and Kong could probably move pretty fast. <laughs> so we gotta have Godzilla doing a. Yeah, flip they've run. carried. They've Godzilla sized Kong back. up, sized Godzilla down, and then sped up Godzilla. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, which um, I don't know. I kind of. Feels weird. I kind of miss like the Godzilla 2014 Godzilla, where you didn't see much of him, and when he did, and when I, he did, uh, he was really big and lumbering and hit hard and seemed very powerful. The uh, the skydive scene. I'll I'll probably not mm -hmm. forget that scene. Uh, it's pretty good. And that's it's a shame that that's a part of the same fucking continuity. That's insane. And it's I guess it's weird as well. The whole sort of the oh the Godzilla's fire? Godzilla's maybe monster? like. Uh, no, the the you know the part where they jump out, like the they dive into the city, and then Godzilla's like silhouettes cast in the. Uh, it's the it's clouds. the choir as well that really gets me in that. Mm -hmm. oh, like that kind of sound. It's more, good. More higher pitched, but yes, <laughs> it's yeah. The, and it it just gives a sense of dread that they're going into mm -hmm. like his world sort of thing, which is really cool. Which um, I guess the thing is though that when they decided, it's like yeah, but Godzilla's kind of like. You know, he's kind of like not so bad. He's uh, he's kind of there. He's the hero to, of Earth. He's gonna curb uh, stomp the, uh, the not us. so great monsters. And now it's like, well, now he's a fucking superhero. Basically, him and Kong yes. running together. And they're gonna beat up Cranky Kong. Cranky yeah, Kong. I, I don't know if it's Cranky Kong, man. Could you imagine Godzilla <laughs> versus Cranky Kong? Kong? Oh, I thought you meant like he like was a chronic masturbator. No, no, it's like Cranky Kong. The OG Donkey Kong, mm -hmm. original Donkey Kong. Nice. Oh, boy. Yeah, that'd know. be cool. They're probably going to keep making those movies forever, by the way. They're, they're pretty successful. That's so, like there's nothing to um, do. It's, I hate it. It's like, guys, you could be making so much more money. It's right there. You could be there. so much more money if yeah, you... Yeah, like good movies and stuff. Yeah. This good film that just came out recently called Godzilla Minus One. Mm. And then you'd be able to maybe... Learn it's the most obvious shit. This happens yeah. every time, by the way. It's like it, uh, Gary's mentioned it with TFA, and I was like, "Yeah, it's true." If TFA was really well written, it would have made even more money. Yeah, don't see why it wouldn't. I don't see why it being better written would make people go, oh, "I don't like that shit." <laughs> uh, well written. The fuck is this? I hate well, what's cool about minus one is it proves as well that there is no pushback to the the notion of having humans in monster mm -hmm. movies. It's just it's just, you got to make it good. Which, by the way, is the case for oh, literally yeah. everything. <laughs> it's like, yep. You know, I, I don't want to see the human story or the people's. It's like, you what would if happened? it was good. You yeah, would if it what was happened, good. What happened, when, when King of the Monsters was coming out, that's what we heard a decent amount is, what are you talking about, like, human drama? We want to see the big lizard. That's And that's what we got in this movie that had maybe 20 minutes of big lizard and then an hour and a half of human drama. What happened? Well. What happened? 
who knows? Maybe they all indeed. those people are gone now, and there's a bunch of new people around. But I was going to say, mm, the um, the EFAT movies for that film, uh, Wolf edited it, and he did edit the final cut of how much monster time there was, and I believe it was seven to eight minutes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, there's not it much. There's not much monster in that monster movie at all. You yep. have to pay a heavy price by sitting all the sitting through all the shitty human crap in there to get mm -hmm. your, your stuff. The lady wants to bring boy, back all the monsters bad. to refresh Earth because we ruined it, right? Yeah. yeah. Mm. Mm. Because why that would you have suck. it be that the drama of the story, the central human drama, is very heavily thematically tied to Big Lizard? Why bother? Yeah. Why bother? Yeah, why? just, yes, just uh, throw why a, hundred, a couple hundred million dollars <laughs> at it, it and, uh, you know... Well, instead of spending right, less less than fifteen million dollars, under to fifteen million. Uh, that's amazing because this movie looks really fucking good. Yep. For a movie that's uh, as low budget, and remember, the director said he wished he had fifteen million, so it sounds like it was a, a good deal lower than that. Yeah, this guy is. Uh, uh, they'll be getting a sequel for this. The well, the director, uh, the director of Godzilla minus one, uh, Japanese name I can't remember. I'm still Takashi Yamazaki. Uh, Takashi Yamazaki, that's right. He was the uh, director, and he was the writer, and he, mm -hmm. I believe he was in charge of the visual effects as well. Yes, he was. Nice. Um, after his last movie, I think in 2019, he was given the reins of the Godzilla, uh, of a Godzilla movie to make. And I think between this one coming out and that last one, I think it was after Shin Godzilla had come out, and people said good things about that, he had uh, the company that uh, runs this T60 it's, uh, or something like Isn't it Toho, don't they? Toho. They, uh, yeah. Mm. yeah. Uh, they had, they essentially scrapped three entire projects because they weren't up to snuff. They weren't good enough. They didn't feel like they were good enough. Which is like the opposite of what happens here when it's like, oh, something was good, crank out as many sequels as you possibly can. Get, a, I mean, get as much money out of it as you can possibly get. Let's be honest, get. even if this thing wasn't good, the word of mouth and celebration of it has kind of dwarfed, like, expectations for them, I'm sure. Mm. Oh, also yeah, is good. <laughs> it had a uh, pretty successful release internationally compared to a lot of, you know, foreign language films that tend to struggle. Um, it just yeah, feels like one of the most talked about and... releases for film uh, for the year. Out of out of mm -hmm. all the things that spread with word of mouth, this one feels like one of the biggest. Which you know, good uh, for it. Absolutely. Which yeah, it's um, it's I believe it's the most successful Japanese Godzilla film now. Uh, yes, um, I believe it is. Nice. Which yeah, which which, <laughs> which I'm still, very glad to hear. Well, it was well, a good one. The thing is, it's still lower than uh Godzilla vs Kong. Which <laughs> oh <laughs> yeah, because Godzilla vs Kong released during the pandemic and it still made like. I, I still think it's, I believe it's the highest grossing at the box office of all of the monster movies that they'd be making. I and think. That was bearing in mind that it also had a very successful launch on HBO Max, like the most successful launch at the time. This will help people understand how we can have it be better. We don't have to settle yeah, for Godzilla so. vs. Kong or Godzilla x Kong. It could be better than I that. I hope so. That people will go into Godzilla x Kong and be like, damn. But, like, I just watched a Godzilla movie that had characters and strong thematic elements, and that those elements were very well tied together, that it was evident that they had an idea for a story they wanted to tell that could leverage Godzilla in a meaningful way for the story and for the theme, and that the, and the human characters don't just need to be there as sort of, like, a thin pretext for a story existing in the first place. Mm -hmm. Yep. Fingers um, crossed. <laughs> it is, uh... <laughs> I, I really, really enjoyed the movie quite a lot. Yeah, we want to do the, um, the whole, you know, left to right, right to left. Sure. Thoughts? Rags first. Uh, all right, you go yeah, there, sure, rags, or, right, Yeah, you go first. So I'm really, really glad that I enjoyed this movie, and my dad did as well. Uh, we went to go see this at the theater, and... Uh, didn't call, go away. Stop. <laughs> I don't want to talk to you. Um, but we hadn't been to the theater in a long time. I hadn't been since uh, Oppenheimer, uh, but he oh, hadn't suitable. been in a yeah, and he hadn't been in a very long time. Uh, so we've kind of been itching to get back into a theater. He's um, uh, he hasn't been out and about too much because of some medical stuff. But now that he's sort of up and moving around again, we were able to go to the theater together and see what turned out to be a really banger movie. He enjoyed it immensely, and so did I. If you're gonna go to a movie. Go on a Tuesday night, because you'll have the whole place to yourself, let me tell you. Um, but yeah, I really, really loved it. 
it was surprisingly good. I had no idea that it was a Japanese film. Uh, I just heard everyone... I, I knew nothing about it going in other than it was a Godzilla movie. Uh, I made sure to not watch trailers. I didn't figure out anything about the plot or what happened or that it was a movie that took place in, you know, right after post-war Japan. Um, I, I didn't know any of that stuff. So it was a super cool surprise when it actually happened. Uh, when the opening sequence on Odo Island, you know, I thought that, that was going to be, oh, okay, this is our neat little intro sort of sequence, our prequel, our flashback. But no, it was, you know, the, the whole movie took place during that time period. And I really loved it. Um, I was glad to get a, something that wasn't like a contemporary uh, set movie. Uh, I, I kind of like it when we go to different time periods and try some things. Yeah. Um, great. I really love the soundtrack. I really like the characters. Um, I think that there was very clearly an artistic and thematic vision that ran throughout the movie. And I was uh, very, very happy. All right, Metal. Yeah, that's me. Hello. Uh, yeah, I mean, I also really, really enjoyed it. Uh, I don't have a lot of touching points with any Godzilla movies, really. I think I watched like the uh, the American one, and what was it, like two thousand the Roland Emmerich one? Hell yeah, the boy, yeah. great one. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't, I don't, was it? I don't think it was. I don't know. I was in the nineties. <laughs> I mean, I've, I've seen, I've seen it as a child. I probably enjoyed it. Uh, probably, I don't know if it holds little up boy these child. days. Little boy child, yeah. But yeah, I'm, I'm a big fan of the, of the vicious Godzilla. That's that's way cooler to me than the look. He's helping the people. Like, nah, it's lame. Yes, oh. I, I Godzilla want, I want... is an allegory for war and destruction. He's, go he's going around fucking shit up. Why? Because he wants territory. Because he's a fucking vicious animal, and people are scared shitless, and they have basically little to no chance of actually defeating the monster. And uh, yeah, that's good. Sh good shit. The characters are actually good. So yeah, as you already said, just destroying the notion that we didn't, that you don't care about the characters. It just needs to be good. It's just a matter of quality, and the quality was good with the characters. You cared about them, and uh, yeah, good shit, good schnitzels. Wow. Uh, yeah, I loved it. I thought it was awesome. Um, there's there's like issues I take with some of the things that happen in it, but overall, I was just like the threads are too strong, and I'm enjoying it too much for it to bother me that much. <clears throat> and the overall, like, it wouldn't damage that, uh, the film, significantly. It's it's a lot of stuff that I feel like I've been kind of kind of looking to see in a Godzilla film, because I sort of, retrospect, look back, and I'm like, damn, I don't really like many of the Godzilla films I've seen that much. Uh, you know, the more so I tolerate a lot of it to get to stuff that I think is really neat, but uh, this one, I felt really captured a lot of the stuff that I would like to see in one, and... Um, I had particular things spoiled, I guess, for the sake of the conversation. I'll explain what that means. But I was spoiled for things in this film in such a specific way that kind of made the uh, watching of it interesting and strange um, for, for what I was expecting and how I was almost tricked by not understanding the spoilers that I thought I had. So that's something. Uh, the, yeah, the, the hyper-vicious monster that is terrifying Godzilla is cool. I, I, I like him. He's, 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 he's super awesome. And um, I was going to say, just as a mention of something that I don't think it come up yet, the, um, the sound design. I love his atomic mm, breath. Amazing. Yeah, it's sound so design. cool. <laughs> Not just the, the soundtrack, theme. but the effects <laughs> and when they come in and when they fade out. Stellar work. The the fucking tension of the trunk 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 down 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 yeah. it's just like no <laughs> um yeah and even like trying to apply some rules to him in terms of overwhelming the sense of regeneration or trying to use physics against him or uh, you know lesser known ones or the um, the recharge rate on the atomic breath it's like these are all really useful things to help uh, change the ticking clock or you know have a sense of winning and losing. To not mention everything else everyone already has, which is that the character work is fire, peak fire, that's what the kids say. Oh, for real, peak for real. Fire. And, um, yeah, I really liked it. Can't wait to talk about it in some more depth Hooray. Uh, whoop whoop. Uh, I think Godzilla Minus One is a really cool movie. I think it's a really solid movie. Uh... I'd say that if there were any issues I was gonna take with it, that would be mainly stemming from the plot. But by way of character and theme, uh, it's really well crafted. They're wound incredibly tight. Uh, like, uh, this, this is said a few times. It's clear that there was an idea for a story here that could involve Godzilla rather than 
let's sort of have Godzilla and then I, I tr like try to sort of work backwards and figure out like a way to uh a way to essentially justify just having big lizard walk around and destroy things. And they had an idea with their central character tethering him uh to Godzilla. The Godzilla represents like thematically he represents an aspect of the main character Koichi's life um regrets um discontent with himself uh to build that up beyond just the physical presence of Godzilla to be really meaningful to his story and to the stories of every character uh and to and it, like it's really cool to see beyond just cool big lizard look at him go look at how terrifying and and cool he is um to have a story that was clearly like inspired and meaningful um it's a film that has something to say and it says it really well uh so yeah i think i think it's a pretty cool movie i like it well then let us begin i suppose we shall talk about the events of the film and what things we really liked and didn't like in it whatever they may be of both which means we start with the opening credits oh i didn't like the uh, second letter I hate it. in those <laughs> All right, next thing. <laughs> anyway, next one. <laughs> I don't know why it's called Godzilla minus one. We were trying to figure that out on our way back home as well. The <laughs> Japanese have, have, have odd naming conventions. They name things weird things. Um, I'm if I was to guess, Godzilla minus one. Uh, uh, oh damn! I just had like a. I wonder if it has to do with the notion of um that the main character as well as many people aren't back yet they're not they're not like they're home not yet full, they're not where they're they full. need to be they've still huh. kind of got some amount of discontent and um something's been left behind in the wake of the war because so much of the film is kind of about them rediscovering and recontextualizing like what exactly it is that they want to be and how they want to lead their lives and well, continue I think we should be we we should probably start off by saying that this movie takes place uh, in, in post-war post Japan. Japan. Right. Really? 1945 post -war Japan. to 1948, I think. I think 48, it is, yeah. Yeah, it is a very, very... This story did not waste its theme. It no. is 100% built around the idea that this is post-war Japan, uh, the state of mind of the Japanese people, you know, the destruction after World War II. Um, everyone talks about the war. Everyone talks about, you know, the veterans... And people who died, families that are torn apart, uh, people who were killed, um, the the reconstruction of the nation after World War II, and uh, it touches briefly into the political climate of what's happening. It is through and through a movie that takes advantage fully of setting itself in a time period. Not yeah. only is it just cool to you know be in that time period, see that kind of technology, um, and how all that works. Uh, but it's used thematically, and the way that it ties that to Godzilla is something we'll talk about later. Um, and, and that's something that I really immensely appreciate. The The setting cannot be um, taken away from what the movie's trying to say in the plot. When we were um, walking back from seeing it, my assumption on Minus One, the best I could come up with was that it relates to the main character's sense of existence, being that he, he's not even 100% clear on whether or not he's alive or dead, or whether or not mm. he's suffered enough or uh, should be doing particular things or whatever. Like it's almost like he's not representative of a life, but rather a he's like a he's like a death that forgot to happen. He's supposed to be he's, he's like a ghost or a zombie. Not not quite. He represents a minus one, who, like waiting to be dead. I wonder if that's uh, tied in somewhat. I mean, <clears> lots, of, lots of survivor oh, skills. Oh, of course, as well, because of the duty he should have done, but he, he, he didn't do, as we learned very quickly in this movie. And all the other people dying <clears throat> because of his failure to actually commit to the things he should probably have done. But was well, baked to... in baked when, with something else uh, yeah. that happened as well. Because I guess it's worth laying out the opening scene of the film. Yes. Yep. Mm-hmm. The opening scene of the film takes place in 1945, uh, which, for our historians out there, Whoa. is, uh, I know, shortly, this is, getting a little with our, our meta-knowledge here, but oh this is the year World War II ends. 
This is the very, very end of the war, tail end of the war. It's just about to end. And on Odo Island, we see a plane landing, plane that we discover is driven by our protagonist, uh, protagonist Koichi Shikishima, I believe is his name. Mm-hmm. Uh, you will, you're going to have to just apologize if I get names wrong. I'm just not as you <laughs> You're going to have to apologize. <laughs> the, other, the others have to apologize. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. That's right. So get it ready. Get, um, get your apologies ready. Get it ready, everyone. Um, but already it's like, oh, okay, this is really neat. We're on an island. It's World War II. All right. Um, all the people are on the island. There's a, he, he lands on the island on a dirty little airfield. Some mechanics come out to check the plane. And, uh... As it is discovered, uh, our head mechanic, Tachibara, Tachibara, I think is his name, or head mechanic, the head mechanic, yes. Yeah, Um, our head mechanic gives the plane an inspection. It's a Japanese, you know, fighter plane, gives it an inspection with all of his guys. And he says, all right, well, we looked the plane up and down. It's amazing you could fly that old, uh, that crappy old plane, which actually... The fact he calls it, a, I think he calls it a bucket of bolts or a thing, bu- bucket of rest, something like that. That will actually be referenced later. But um, he says, it was amazing that you were able to fly this uh, plane and landed here. Uh, but we, we gave it the old look over, and your plane seems to be uh, completely functional. There's nothing hmm. wrong with it. Why didn't to you explode, Koichi's... loser? Hmm? Yeah. To which Koichi asks, uh, what are you implying exactly? Because Koichi is a kamikaze pilot. The very mm-hmm. end of the war. It's his job to f- fly a plane full of explosives into uh, American cruisers and whatnot. So, uh, by the way, I was I was reading uh, or, or watching a video that was talking about some of this stuff. Um, through the course of the war, the amount of sheer lead that an American battleship could put into the air to destroy enemy ships became so insanely high volume that the the thought process was there's no way that the japanese were like there's no way we can do really any damage to these planes by just like shooting at them from a distance and stuff because we'll just get shredded by the any air so we we're we're just going to do this idea of well it's uh, we might get a better return on our planes if we load them full of explosives and kamikaze into them uh so there's a lot of interesting i guess math and uh Stuff that sort of goes into that strategy, but mm-hmm. yep, they were kamikaze. Koichi's a kamikaze pilot, and I guess he got cold feet, uh, which is pretty understandable. That's a big thing to ask yeah. someone. And yeah. um, while he's sitting on the island and he hasn't taken off yet, one thing that I really like is that one of the mechanics from the island, as Koichi's out on the on the beach, just kind of looking out into the water, one of the mechanics comes up to him and says, "You know, I don't blame you." For not, you know, doing this. What's the point of uh, following the order to die honorably when the outcome of the war is already decided? Yeah, because J- Japan didn't have a chance. They were gonna, they were gonna lose. Uh, it had been, like, it was, it was, it was gonna America have. They, involved, it was over. America was had a America had a huge army. They had two atomic bombs. Uh, of course, there was the the well, war with China that with, Japanese uh, had been involved in. America um, could replenish losses and japan yeah. couldn't japan yeah. couldn't exactly japan was just getting just smoked at this point they had no chance so i really enjoy this perspective uh of this one mechanic saying that i don't blame you and yeah. it's something that we'll see throughout the film you get multiple perspectives from different characters concerning this running theme of what the film is trying to say and its perspectives that it has on the concepts of patriotism and honor and sacrifice uh, and I, I th- throughout the whole movie, y- you get people's different perspectives on it. It doesn't take like this super duper hard singular stance on it that just like covers everything. The film is, it's like it's made by adults for adults. That's I nice. Think it, what it's trying, <laughs> it doesn't treat you like a child. It can actually say things. It can actually have a theme. It can actually well, have messages. Um... It's nice when a film can take like a premise that on its face might seem absurd of look, it's like a dinosaur that shoots lasers out of his mouth. Yeah. Um, but it's getting really lame at this point when like characters sort of look at the camera and wink. It's like, ha, ah, isn't that silly? It's like, can you shut the fuck up? Like, yeah. can you can you just take your story seriously? One of the things I describe it. this movie as is reverent. 
um, not just in its, uh, its, its, its homage to the old, uh, you know, 50s, 60s Godzilla stuff, but just, it, it takes itself seriously. Just because mm -hmm. it's a big monster, big lizard, as Fringy said, that shoots a heat ray, that doesn't mean that you can't treat it with reverence. It doesn't mean that it's, I mean, this is a big deal, a monster running through and destroying cities and ripping battle cruisers in half. That's a big deal. Well, we said it about you know, it's Lord of the Rings. Uh, right. You have the wizard at like a funeral. Like, is that going to cause any issues? Like, not if everyone takes it seriously. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One of I mean, it's interesting to look at because um, this is jumping ahead a bit, but the way that Godzilla moves is very stilted, kind of like they're trying to emulate the old look. You know, before it, use of visual yeah, effects. Yeah, he looks. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, not where just he holds he moves, his arms out by too, his yeah. sides, and it's very, it's very like sudden movements with very sharp stops. Um, and somebody could look at that and be like, oh, that's that's kind of like silly. But it's not though, because again, everybody in the story Everyone takes treats it seriously. seriously. And you're taking it seriously because presumably as you're watching the film, you're starting to grasp the nature of what Godzilla represents to Koichi and everybody really. Yeah. Um, what he represents is significant and meaningful to those characters. And so it's meaningful to you beyond obviously like, look, big lizard who shoots laser out of his mouth. When you have a, when you have that moment where the character smiles and winks at the camera, hoo, 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 are we having fun? Like, okay, but we're in a different movie now. When you've done mm -hmm. that, we're we're no you're you're trying to tell me you're either trying to have it both ways, which you can't really do, um, or you're or or you've just turned the movie into something that's lighthearted and fun and goofy. When I mean, it's it's up to you if you want to make your film like that. But well, just, what's typically uh, annoying about it is cool. Make fun of the thing you didn't create that's better than what you're <laughs> making. Yeah. Um, make fun of the thing know. that you're using to make hundreds of millions of dollars and, and banking the on and, of, and the original creators who at least made something novel and interesting. So, yeah, cool, bro. The mechanic talks to the guy, says, I don't blame you. Why throw your life away when it's not going to change the outcome of yeah. the war and it's not going to make a difference? The film's got a lot of ideas in relation to, like, you know, sacrificing yourself for your country or for the people you love or for all of that, but also the nature in which you do so, that there's a lot of nuance to why you would throw your life away slash give it for something greater. I find that the, it was quite, for lack of a better term, mature of the film to be like... Not only do the, is there honor to be found in the cultural nature of like kamikaze pilots, because of course there would be from their perspective in terms of everything they have to give up to do so and what they do it for, but that also they they consider it like you know there's lots of criticism to give on the nature of particular uh, uh, battles that they may you know do it or do not, and, and like in this case it's just like why now war's over it's, it's just yeah. there's no need, <clears throat> but by the time we hit the end of the film, uh, I, I quite like the almost reflective perspective on giving your life in order for uh, certain damage to be done. You know, you know, without being more specific, I just, I find it, uh, it's, it's super related to like, just, just all the perspectives you can have on war and bad, but in a more complicated and interesting way. And yeah, in this case, um, um, you just don't see this perspective that often in films, like the kamikaze pilot and how he feels about this whole thing, and then what people mm -hmm. think of kamikaze pilots, whether or not they're successful in the missions, and the many different ways you can actually commit to something like that. Because I feel like the American version would just be, uh, I, I don't say this derogatorily, but, you know, Independence Day, right? Where, hello, right. boys, I'm back! back. <laughs> And it's yeah. Like, yeah, we'll cut away from the violent explosion and how that would have felt for uh, that guy when that happened, you know? Yeah, and, and the heroism of it and the courage that it that's required of it, but like, you know, I just feel it's a much more bold position to be like, I just can't, well, I'm too scared. The guy who, yeah, mm. the guy who's terrified to do it, and so he, he doesn't do it. And then that places him in a situation that uh, is going to be incredibly pivotal moving forward in how it ties that to a different event that is similar. <laughs> Yeah, um, the the film's positions on what makes a worthy sacrifice, the you know, the point where honor and patriotism and sort of meet and rub along the value of what human life is, is a really it was really nice to see this in a Godzilla movie because you could make a movie that's purely about these sorts of things that didn't have Big Lizard, but you know here we are. Uh, no, it's just leverage the big lizard for thematic purposes which Absolutely. is really cool so I mean, big lizard shows up pretty soon he, he, he does. does he shows up quite quick <laughs> quite yeah. notable I was 
I was very surprised with. I was very happy about uh, that. <laughs> it answered a question I had in, in my own head, because a lot of the time we appreciate um, Alien and Aliens do this. Uh, several other films, The Thing is of course a classic example, but just like how long and how much restraint one can have before they show you the thing you've heard about, the thing you're here for, that sort of stuff. And um, I was just like, well, even though I have lots to praise for films like that, that really work on their human stuff before they bring in the threats, at the same time, you know, how well can we, how well can we do while bringing in the monster really early? I feel well, like the film answers that pretty well. Of how you can bring it in really early because Godzilla yeah, shows up what, five about like five ten minutes into the movie, and yeah. he, of, he's like, not he doing a cameo. Him. He's uh, he's coming no, in. No, no, no. <laughs> yeah. This is a big deal of him emerging from uh, from the ocean, and then and then the guys on the ground talking about how they've heard the stories about Godzilla, you know, from the the locals in the area. Yeah, the big dinosaur yeah. critter. Um... The it's nighttime, and then the uh, the the raid sirens start to sound, and everyone's mm. like, "Oh man, what what's up? Are the you know the Americans are coming?" Uh, yeah, obviously, what you'd assume if you're out there, uh, but it turns out it is indeed Godzilla. Godzilla, he he's here, and um, for a movie that's under fifteen million dollars, Godzilla looks pretty good. It helps that everything surrounding Godzilla looks very real. And that the characters treat it like it's very real, and the world treats it like it's real, which like allows me to be, buy. I feel this um, has to be a clear example of something we've talked about before, which is that if a director knows how to use visual effects correctly, mm. they can achieve far better results with a lot less money. Uh, yeah, absolutely. If you have something that's fake and everyone treats it like it's fake, or there doesn't seem to be any. Um, I mean, what, what would a good example be of, I mean, you probably, you see it all the time in these, in, you know, superhero movies where it's just a CGI flurry of stuff happening, explosions and fighting and armies and everything's clashing together and all of our guys are going through, hey, hey, hey we're having so much fun, mm. Ooh, ah, I get to get you, then it doesn't it have any impact. Uh, it's just simple. no one's treating it seriously. You don't even look like you are where you are. Yeah. Like, you don't look like you're in the place that you're in, let alone what CG uh, people or creatures or monsters that they might be interacting with. Uh, but there's a, like a lot of really great set dressing in the film. It very much sells you that this is mid 20th century Japan, post war Japan. Because, you know, but it's not just influencing visual effects, it's also influencing an immense amount of set design in this film of, uh, you know, like markets, sort of um, run down markets, dilapidated, destroyed parts of the urban area. Um, Everything from the weapons that people hold, the yeah. uniforms and the clothes that they wear, Art. the technology, like the radios and the telegrams, um, the the sets of the you know bombed out Tokyo and Ginza, and you know being on the destroyer ships and the little dinghies out in the water, um, it, it all it all looks very very real. Uh, so when you combine all of those elements, as we've said, a lot of real props that everyone's wearing and uh, real sets that people are in, everyone treating everything like it's real, and treating it very, you know, like, um, like it has the stakes and consequences, then it makes the things that are CGI, the, you know, there are certain elements, I'm sure, of the, of the battles and, uh, you know, the destruction, and then, of course, Godzilla itself, it, you, it makes it really easy to buy. Well, yeah, because when Godzilla shows up, all these guys are terrified. Naturally, oh, yes. Yeah. The um, the Godzilla from the newer Western versions, he's almost um, I, I don't know how else to say this. Maybe you can give me better words, but he's almost handsome. While this one I, is I, gnarly, I, like yeah, is, this yeah. one looks like he'll it's fuck like you old up. Godzilla. Yeah, yeah uh, it looks like uh... Godzilla's kind of like a cuddly chongus. You know, he's a big <laughs> chongo. Yeah. He, is. he is, and he's got like very approachable kind of face as well. It obviously it looks like he can mess shit up, but he, he's, a, he's a bit of a cuddly critter, whereas, yeah, this one's, like, full of jagged, sharp edges, yes. constantly looks angry. Well, and the, um, um, I think, is it the first shot we get of him with the spotlight where he's yeah. not, it's not like a shot where you see his eye open, or you see a, a, a silhouette really far away, or you see, like, a one stomp come down. It's more, you see the whole thing, and he sort of does this big bodily turn and screams at the light, and you're like, whoa, what the fuck? And it's like, yeah, yeah he's coming. And also showing it from the ground level as well. All of the shots during the opening sequence show Godzilla like from a ground level. There's no big aerial shots. No. Um, so you're taking it in from the same perspective as um, all of the guys on the ground. There is. It's definitely. I, he does have this. I don't know. It's it's just, it just well. seems like a classic old monster. Guys. It's a bit, it's a bit uh, disconcerting. Whereas, again, new Western Godzilla is way more like approachable. 
Um, well, and and to be fair, that's almost a compliment to the design because the story they're going for with him is that he's like he is a, a protector of, a of sorts, and it's like eh, yeah, okay. That's this fine. Godzilla yeah. is here. He's, he's he's a big lizard. He doesn't give a fuck. He's here to yeah. destroy. This one ain't going to protect he, anything. You know? <laughs> in his, yeah, anything in his path. Very much the very much the allegory of war kind of stuff that we had from the you know the the earlier kinds of Godzillas. Um, he's not your friend. Godzilla's no, bad. Just looking he for more territory. Everything. It's like this city is in my way, and I don't actually know what that means. But I'm going to destroy everything because this is mine now. This is my Japan, my Tokyo. Yeah. <laughs> So the the plot uh, as we move forward is Godzilla shows up. Oh fuck! What are we gonna do? Um, can't probably really do much because we're just some guys on an island. But hey, that fighter plane guy just mm. arrived, and that plane is parked on the runway. How very interesting! So as all Ooh. of the mechanics in Koichi are hiding in a bunker after they see Godzilla show up, um, the the head mechanic says, "Hey, hey." You sneak over to your plane, sneak over to your Zero over there. You got some 20 millimeter guns on that thing. 20 mil millimeter guns, they're like Desert Eagles. They can kill anything. Yeah. So, <laughs> so you, you go climb over there, and then when Godzilla walks in front, you, you let him have it. And so uh, that's what the plan is. Koichi sneaks over to the Zero, and he gets inside, and he climbs in. And then Godzilla kind of lumbers in front of it, and he's got his sights, and the Godzilla's right there, and Koichi's got his hand on the gun, and he's he's trembling, and he and he can't do it. He can't mm -hmm. fire off the gun, and that the the mechanics in the bunker with their little Arisakas, little guns, little bolt action rifles. They one of them gets really afraid. And he starts shooting at Godzilla. And then mm -hmm. all of them start shooting at Godzilla with their rifles. And it perturbs Godzilla. He becomes upset at this. Amy. And he proceeds to start biting them and throwing them and uh, crunching them underfoot. And uh, yeah, it, it goes about how you would expect. He's yeah. A, he's a bit mean. Which, which actually brings up a point that I kind of like about this movie. I think that there was an a very clear and obvious opportunity to have Godzilla. Uh, I want to talk about. I, I basically want to talk about the absence of gore in this movie, and how I kind of like it. So obviously, in the first scene, Godzilla is leaning down with his mouth and he's crunching people, but instead of just like biting them in half and just leaving a like a, a torso and legs on the ground, he throws them and they go ah, he throws them away. Or he crunches people. And we don't see, like, the flattened gore of people who've been stepped on. We don't see bodies that have been dissected or anything like that. Um, and, and I think I kind of like that. The film treats Godzilla extremely seriously. The destruction that we see him cause later is ominous and terrible. And the mind fills in the kind of death mm. toll that would happen when all this destruction takes place. And I think that being really, really upfront with a whole bunch of gore and body parts and dismemberment and kind of stuff like that, which would be more realistic, sure, I think it would come across as more distracting to me. Um, um, I don't know that I think I, anything I, one way or the other on this. I, I uh, understand I why people would disagree or not feel a certain way, but I, I think that everything in the movie sells the terror of it and the the, the death and violence of it without showing very what would have been otherwise very very prominent gory scenes um i I, that, yeah, I, I, I could have what you saying with that yeah like that they it's sold whether or not they have gore but at the same time if there were heavy gore in this based on the damage he does to individuals i probably would be defending it as consequent you know yeah violence. i I yeah. can understand that. I I think I prefer without. Maybe it's just a taste thing for me. Uh, um, well, but, I mean, uh, I would say that like one of the biggest things that took me out of Dunkirk is people getting shot and no blood. Whereas by comparison, Saving Private Ryan is very uh, honest about like what it looks like when someone gets. shot. I would shot. agree in that sense. Only yeah, I'd agree that out. if someone gets shot and there's no blood, that's bizarre. Um, and it's not even like a big ask to have a blood splatter or a blood a blood spray when someone gets shot. That's not that's not really a you know a big well, deal. Well, I mean, I'm talking uh, about even beyond that because having Private Ryan shows people with like their guts and entrails. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. I'm I'm talking about like Dunkirk and you know 
yeah. even the, the small allowance of just having blood uh, when someone gets shot. But, um, well, but... I, I guess all that highlights is the difference between, like, how well you can... Because, yeah, I don't, I don't see any problem with, like, not seeing, you know, body parts and arms and legs and stuff flying around when Godzilla is attacking anybody. Because, like you said, the film sells the destruction and the carnage uh, without yeah, you necessarily but... needing to see, you know, heads flying around or arms or legs or blood and guts and everywhere. You get his, his screaming, his, like, lumbering power and then the darkness as well. Like, it's it, it all works really well together. Mm -hmm. Um... But uh, getting back to the movie, Godzilla pretty much kills virtually everyone. Uh, Koichi is knocked mm -hmm. unconscious, or he falls unconscious, um, and when he wakes up, all of the bodies of the mechanics have been uh, put together, um, or, or have been laid out together on, on blankets by the, so the survivor, the head mechanic. The head mm -hmm. mechanic is obviously very much in distress. All of his friends have been killed, and he blames Koichi. He says, if you didn't shoot the gun, you didn't shoot the gun at Godzilla, and that's why everyone died. This is your fault. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. uh, so now, I, not I only about right. something, because the, uh, the, 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 this Godzilla is not fully grown up yet, if I remember correctly. Oh, yeah, he's well, smaller, for correct. anybody who's a fan of Godzilla in general, yeah. in that opening scene, you'd be like, he's a little small. He's, like, he's yeah. a bit small. <laughs> he's a bit small. Uh, but you're right, Metal. That's right. That's a yeah. good point. One that I, is, I, I, uh, I was I was wondering maybe that that cannon might have actually done some damage at this point. That was my time. thinking too. I yeah, yeah I, I, I agree. I so think that they leave it helped. up to interpretation. It might have. I mean, yeah. twenty millimeter cannons on a fighter are they're nothing to scoff at. No. So, uh, especially if you've got a pair of them, the, the the movie doesn't say whether or not it would. Or wouldn't no, have done I don't anything. think whether you don't it would know. have worked is even what is super important there. Is that he didn't even he didn't try. Um, yeah, the, the paralyzed the with the mechanic. Fear, right? The mechanic believes yeah. reasonably that it would have done yeah. something, uh, and that, um, in, in that he in his emotional state and perhaps for practical reasons, you know, you didn't shoot Godzilla, and it ended up killing everybody. This is your fault. You didn't do what you needed to do. So people died. That's, you didn't yeah. do your duty. So people, you know, our friends died. Which is also now it's it's now tethered as well. His decision not to commit to the kamikaze attack is now tethered to Godzilla as well. Like this event yeah. has bound. You don't just have all of the weight of this event, but it's now also been bound in Koichi's mind to the war in general and um, his not you know doing the kamikaze, which would have killed him. So now he's alive. Uh, when these guys wouldn't have been, and that's like a looming specter over the entire uh, story for him, like personified through Godzilla. Yeah, to be clear, like it's, it's a good chance that even if he'd failed to kill Godzilla, that Godzilla would have been distracted enough that the other guys may not have died. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, but uh, you know, it's an alternate, an alternate world that doesn't exist because he didn't do that. So yeah. this is where he's at now. And then the next scene is they're on a, a troop transport boat. I believe the mechanic has gathered up all of the... He's got the photos of all of the yeah, guys. Yeah, the, the belongings of the dead. Yes, uh, all the personal so photos of them and their families, yeah, and he yeah. gives it to Koichi. And like, I, for obvious reasons. Done. Yeah. For pretty obvious, yeah. They're dead. They're like, the, you failed. They died because of you. Now the, these are yours. All these photos of their families and mementos of their death, they're, they're yours now. You have to carry. You have to carry this around with you. Yep. Um, in a very literal sense. So we get our thematic sort of parallel there. Uh, and uh, everyone on the ship, that they got their caps on. Everyone's just kind of huddled down. Everyone looks haggardly. All these soldiers on this transport heading back for Japan. You can clearly tell it's been a long war. These guys are just, the, they're, just at, they're just at the end of it. Everyone looks rough. No one's happy. No one's talking. It's a very somber kind of thing. Uh, so... It, it, it's. I think it's good that they kind of have that. Leads into the, I guess, yeah. environment that we're about to find ourselves in, in particular. But then the mechanic goes and he 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 leaves. The mechanic heads off to go be somewhere else. Koichi looks at the photos briefly, has kind of like a moment of terror, realizing what these are that he's been given. And then Koichi heads home. Koichi lives in Tokyo. Uh, so fun for shit. Yeah, uh, for yeah, those no, who don't know, Tokyo was don't look so good at this time. Uh, yeah, Tokyo was specifically firebombed by uh, America. It was a it's a city built of mostly wood, so they got firebombed, and everything's uh, everything's kind of destroyed. 
the you know, there's rubble everywhere, and when Koichi finally returns to the address where he lived, he meets um, he meets a care he meets one of our characters, uh, a distressed woman named. Uh, S- is that oh, let me. I, uh, I think it's Sumiko. Sumiko. Yeah. Let, let me just pull up a cast list just so I remember. I need to get used to. Yeah, I, I believe her name is. Sumiko. That's alright, I'm sure everyone will follow if we just say lady. Yeah, Sumiko. <laughs> lady. So, Sumiko is there. She's a, a slightly uh, older woman than him. Than him, And uh, she's in distress. She's in the rubble. She's going through things. And she recognizes Koichi. Like, they're neighbors. And she says, what the fuck? Koichi, you- you're alive. Why How are, are you, you alive? alive? Are you, you're alive? A, you went to be a kamikaze pilot. How did you possibly come back? I think- and then... What's notable about this is that there are explanations for why someone may have come back that wouldn't relate to their cowardice or whatever. But he doesn't Absolutely. provide any. So yeah, yeah. He, he doesn't make excuses. He could he have said yeah, the war was, was over before I was deployed. Something... We ran out of planes. I never got to actually see, you know, action. Uh, you know, we we just we I wasn't able to get to a plane. All sorts of all, all sorts of reasons. But it's, he doesn't uh, defend himself. Someone I've seen celebrate about the character, which I think is a notable aspect is that he doesn't hesitate to be shamed like there, there's no like i would yeah. I, making excuses or lying to people there's just there's just nah i fucked up i'm i'm a coward well, he, that's what he, i am uh, he's got he's got some major self-loathing that's yeah. uh driving a lot of the decisions that he makes this is not a case of him being in denial of what he did the thing that he's in denial of is whether he's even alive. Sumiko is very emotionally distressed right now as anyone would be in her position she has lost her children her neighbors, almost everyone she knows has died in the air raids. Um, war has taken pretty much everyone from her, and she is grieving right now. And that explains why she essentially says, if you would have died like you were supposed to, none of this would have happened. Yeah. Uh, but if you and all the soldiers would have died like you should have. Yeah. Well, it's like the weight of the entire outcome of the war yeah. thrown on him. Yeah. And Which he's obviously that's. Kind of done anyway. Yeah, obviously that's not what would have happened. Uh, uh, it, it was a it was a settled war long before this, but you know she's distressed, so she kind of takes it up on him. She kind of smacks him a little bit, and he just sort of takes it, and she's yeah, crying. Just... And uh, he asks where his parents are. Koichi wants to know where are my parents, and Sumiko says they uh, they died, kind of along with everyone else. Yeah, like like her children, like she had yep. like two children, if I remember correctly. And yeah, those yeah, both perished as well. Yep. Um, very, uh, very grim scene. It's really, you know, the bombed city, war, war sucks, and it's really taking a very realistic approach to that. And the way that people approach, you know, the destruction of their homes and everything around them. This is the second time in a very short amount of time that two characters, when faced with the death around them, react, uh, emotionally to Koichi. Yep. So he's kind of gotten a big double hit, uh, from that, um... Consequences Very... of which we see thoroughly throughout the entire film. This is not a man who doesn't uh, get extremely affected by every single event he's been through, including everyone reacting to those events around him. Mm-hmm. So he goes to the rebel of his house, and he you know tries to put things together. And shortly after, I believe we have a scene where he is in a marketplace. Um, it, they do a really good job, sort of selling the. The depression and desperation of people just cobbling together everything that they can. There's, you know, there's not that much food to go around. There's no work to go around. Everyone's just kind of trying to figure out what to do. You know, what do you, what do you even do when all the homes get bombed and a lot of people yeah. are dead and, you know, resources are skint. And so we there's a little marketplace with a bunch of stalls and stuff, people trying to get by. And Koichi's there and... There is a there's a call from someone in the crowd that there's a thief. There's a thief. Stop her. Stop oh. that thief. And there's this woman and she's running through the crowd. And as she runs through the crowd, she hands Koichi something and takes off. Well, um, is it not worth kind of pointing out? Because it's not even random that he bumps into her. I mean, it's somewhat in terms of the wider scale of this whole area. But it, it, would it be said that crime is occurring and he feels necessary to try and step in the way of her? Try to stop her from stealing? And she hands him the baby because he's in the way. And she has every intention to come and retrieve. It's just that it's an interesting result of probably guilt again, that he's like, I can make a difference here. Someone's stealing something. I'll stand in their way. And then this happens as a result. Yeah. I don't, 
Also, before we proceed forward, there was one last thing that happened uh, right after uh, right after Koichi uh, meets Sumiko. Uh, I believe she hands him a letter from, or no, it, Koichi's got a letter from his parents with him, and uh, the note from his parents wanted him to come back alive. Yeah, come back alive. That's right. So he's at the he's sitting there all depressed in the rubble of his building, uh, of his home where he grew up. Parents are dead with a letter of theirs that told him to come back alive. And yet everyone is really, up, you know, she, she's really upset that he came back alive. And, you know, his honor was being questioned by the, maybe questioned by the mechanic back on Odo Island. So, yeah, there's this little thing there. Uh, but yeah, uh, he's, he has now been given this baby by this, this thief who was running through. And the thief has run away and he's left with his baby. Uh, and so he just kind of sits there waiting for someone to come and claim it, not really knowing what to do. He's just been given this random baby by this random chick, and he can't, uh, he, he can't just uh, leave the baby there. He thinks about it, but yeah. he just can't do it. He can't just leave this baby there. Um, and as he kind of walks away with the baby, try, probably still thinking about what he's going to do exactly, uh, the thief lady... Uh, she's right there, waiting for him to uh, get out of the market stalls and kind of out of eyesight of everybody. Uh, she doesn't have a place to stay, as we learn the baby is not hers. In the destruction of the bombing, uh, the baby's mother, with her dying wish, told Noriko to take it and, uh, you know, take care of the baby. Uh, so she's kind of been saddled with this responsibility, in a way, of taking care of this infant who needs help after the mother has died. Um, and uh, they sort of shack up together, Koichi and Noriko, and uh, the baby, whose name is Akiko, I believe yes. so. Yeah, it's Akiko. A real easy bit of cause and effect, too, but she obviously notable about him is that he didn't ditch the baby. And then she's mm -hmm. like, you know, that's oh, interesting that you wouldn't do that. And then it's like, I could just, I guess, follow him. That he's like, leave me alone, don't care about you. Then she's like, yeah, but you're not going to let us just starve out here. So basically yeah, so relying I'm, I'm on... With you. <laughs> yeah, like, like she knows that she's obviously imposing, but that he will likely help her. Which, you know, Which, makes uh, sense it's considering she has it's got big responsibility. Setup, you know, for, for uh, this dynamic, that this is how it manifested. Um, probably the most important relationship in the, uh, in the film between these two. Mm -hmm. yeah, oh, yeah, I'd say so. And again, all of this is uh, still, you know, we're still very much using the setting that we've chosen post-war Japan after in a, in a bombed out city. We've got, you know, someone returning home from the war, doesn't have his family, she doesn't have her family, she's got the kid of someone who's died, so it's kind of brought them all together in this sort of uh, tragic way. But they end up shacking uh, up together at Koichi's um, home, we'll call it that. Yeah, it's, a, it's, it's a bit right now, it's, it's, looks pretty exactly bad. it's a fixer-upper, is what they say. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it keeps, just the, the, keeps the rain off, sort of. Well, but, kind uh, of, yeah. I think, I think yeah, it's kind the of. rain getting in in later scenes. Yeah, they got little pans on the floor is, to catch the rain. It is shelter. It's better than yeah, just it sleeping is, outside. Better than nothing. Now he's starting to look for... He's got to get a job, because at this yeah. point he's accepted the responsibility of taking care of the two. Uh, and I believe that's when he starts... He, he finds the job that uh, pays well, which... Is like that raises eyebrows. It's like yeah, yeah she's what, immediately what kind, like, are you sure? Kind of this, like, right? Well, because what That's... he reveals is that he's going to be a minesweeper, uh, which of course is a dangerous job. He's directly yeah. putting himself out in danger of potentially getting. He also, um, he doesn't want to tell her or slash reveal to her yet the the nature of his uh, surviving the war. Right? No, he's uh, it's something that. It's something that um, is revealed to, like, Sumiko, but a lot of other characters don't find out until after yeah. they've spent some time with him. Because yeah. the, uh, the group that he links up with on the minesweeping boat, they don't find out until sometime later. Yeah, uh, in yeah fact, they know spent, he was like, part of the war, of but together they don't know the details. Before. I, I think it's actually, because I think it's, it's after the time jump, so it's after a couple of years that they eventually find out. It's not the kind of yeah. thing that he'll proactively bring up for people to know and then criticize him for. But it's the kind of thing that if it gets found out, he's not going to make any defenses of himself. No. Um, that's kind of like the nature of, of how he, he uh, engages with people on the subject. It's also uh, important that uh, Sumiko, the, the woman neighbor from before, she's noticed that this woman and the child are now living with Koichi, and she gives them, uh, she gives them a bag of, uh, the last bag that she has of rice to make rice gruel for the baby. 
So she's helping oh, yeah. them out. She Again, I like her, her, um, I liked her yeah. input on the whole like, so you, you picking these people up, you, you think that makes you a saint? And he's like, no, 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 they just, they just showed up. And she's like, they're still there. You picked them up. You know what I mean? Like, like mm, there's no, yeah. you can't argue around that. Uh, and, and moreover, you, do you know what you're doing? Because uh, you've taken on the responsibility of uh, raising this kid. So you need to know what you're doing. And like, so, you can't just take on the responsibility and then just sort of, like, stumble your way through it. And so she starts to just get directly involved in uh, yeah, helping it, raise the kid. I'm glad they didn't, you know, the, the, it's not like it would have ruined the film or anything, but if she'd been just a one-dimensional neighbor who hates him throughout the whole film or something, versus, like, she does still have a lot of hatred for him at this point, but she is like, wait, is, is the baby okay, though? Like, do you actually yeah. know? Yeah, yeah. She's, she's, uh, she's, well, she's a mother who lost her two kids. Exactly, she's a mother who yeah. lost her kids. Which, she specifically um, asked, uh, this, she specifically uh, asked if Noriko can breastfeed. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, exactly. And she learns that it's not actu- uh, Noriko isn't actually Akiko's mother, then, you know, it, then she gives the rice and helps him out, and uh, then it's, um, th- there's a point I'm like, this oh, is, this uh, is, like, really, they're doing something with this. Once you start to get uh, to this point, point, you start to realize, like, oh, yeah, okay, I'm, I'm probably in for, like, a, at least a decent movie. Yeah, Listen, um, it's, it's not, because they, they're, they're sneaking characters. it in almost. It's like, wait, where's my big lizard? It's like, right now, dealing with a family ravaged by war that are completely, exactly. you know, disconnected from each other. The baby isn't related to the guy, isn't related to the girl, isn't related to the neighbor. You know what I mean? Like, the... An unlikely combination of people just trying to live, and you're like, "Wait, where's my lizard?" Mm-hmm. It's like you don't need the yeah. lizard yet. Well, you're okay. And um, because this is th- th- this film's got a decent number of characters, like a decent it number does. of yes. speaking characters, Big cast. and each of them have their own temperaments, their own sort of um, th- their own manner of speaking and holding themselves, and of course their own motives and drives and um, and and wants and fears, rather than just being you know characters that will be here to service. Um, the plot for Koichi, or you know, to service him without anything going on for themselves as well. When you see yeah, that, it's like, he's... oh, okay, okay, we're we're probably in for like a decent movie at the very least. Um, yeah, they're, they're doing stuff for the care. different characters. It's not just a protagonist and some orbiters. It is absolutely yeah. a story that has these other people characters and perspectives. Own motives in their own stories that are running in tandem with his. He was able to get a government job because in post-war Japan, getting work is you know it's difficult. Infrastructure has been mm-hmm. destroyed. A lot of people have died. A lot of things are, you know, in, in ruins. But he was able to get a job, a government job, clearing mines. And Which, Noriko uh, is very concerned. She does not want him to, you know, perish doing this job. She's very, you know, she, she doesn't want him to get killed. Yeah. She values his life immensely. The thing is, is that it's the money. But what else is it that you're taking on a job that's going to be putting you in harm's way, putting your life at risk? There's an element of like, hmm, also just, is it just the money? Or do you want to put yourself in a dangerous situation where you might die doing something that you believe to be of service? Well, not believed to be, that is of service to the country. It's a good yes. time skip as well. because uh, Yeah, two years. Just coming back in now and she's she's like caring for him as though she is uh, his his wife almost. Like, and, and the way that they're, they're dressed, the house is in better repair. It's just like... We had all the components we need to understand that if you just simply add time, then of course this is going to be the relationship going forward. Mm-hmm. Well, it's, it's interesting they, um, that they're like in the state of almost a de facto marriage, but they're not married, no. uh, which will sort of be a thing that starts to get addressed more as, uh, as time goes on. And again, how does he get a job? Well, he gets a job clearing the mines from the war. So everything, uh, the war is, a, is an omnipresent factor in this movie. Living in this setting, it Which, sort of um, colors everything about kind of what happens, what people think. Um, I think it's it, it's used it, when uh, when movies do this. Uh, that like it's not like oh you know September nineteen forty five Dunzo. It's like well no, I mean no, the soldiers are still do. deployed for years afterward. Obviously, all the countries have to re uh, develop all of their infrastructure, mm. um, occupations. I think America occupied Japan until was it like four or five years later that they were still there? Something. I, I can't quite remember. The, the point being that, you know, post-war, it's like, well, yeah, there is post-war. There is recovery, rebuilding, um, reorganizing of governments and institutions. And it's good to see what does it look like for regular people to navigate that situation. Because I just feel like we don't see it enough in media. We got a lot of stories about what happens in World War II, obviously. But not so mm. many stories that deal with the direct post-war sort of day-to-day life. Yeah, um, it's funny how, how this not only applies into like Star Wars and, or sci-fi in general. It's like, oh, what about all these normal characters? 
You can do the same thing with real life stuff. <clears throat> That's true. That's like true. More, but we, like, oh, what are we, we gonna do? What, what are we gonna? What, what, is, what are these people all gonna do? Like, whether they get jobs? How do these deep sea mines? How are they, how are they gonna get rid of those? It's like, yeah, just fucking blow them up and just cut them up. It's like, oh, okay. Um, it's but interesting. E yeah, the the elements of the war pervasive throughout the film kind of colors over everything. Mm -hmm. And his in a lesser film, oh, I just got a really good paying job and it's dangerous and it's just a totally random thing that's in no way really connected at all. But, you know, a lot of mines that were deployed by both sides in the war, someone's got to clear them. That's our well, this job. Will, this will be a good example again in, in terms of storytelling. I mean, how do you get your characters into a situation where... Because obviously the question is, well, how do we get them to interact with Godzilla again? Yes. Yeah. I mean, you know, that's what's about to happen. It's like, well... We could just have it be that he gets a job that doesn't really mean anything to him, like, as a character, and then that brings him into the path of Godzilla. But what does it look like when he made a deliberate choice to take a job that was dangerous, knowing that he has an amount of guilt over having survived through uh, perceived cowardice, to then take on a job that is dangerous and also of service that then brings him into contact with Godzilla? It's just like a, it's just a better way of making that happen than just, oh, it just happens, you know, just luck. You mm -hmm. know, it, it, Whenever that, whenever there's luck, it's it's worthwhile to see if there's an opportunity to make it a choice, like a character-driven choice that makes something just worth pointing out. She's really concerned about his well-being. She does not want him to die. Uh, obviously, she's probably grown attached to him in a way, and because you know, pragmatically, she needs you know someone to help her take care of the baby. Um, but this is kind of the first time in the movie that uh, Koichi has had someone express very plainly to him that they're concerned for his life and his well-being, that they mm -hmm. don't want him to die. Um, so it's going to be a thing running through the movie. Some people are upset that he's alive. Some people want him to be alive. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah. Um, Isn't it nice when you have different characters with different things that uh, think different things? I should use... <laughs> I was going to say, what, are they holding different things? I guess so. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I thought I'd, I'd do a complete sentence at the same time around. <laughs> a basket, and one of them is holding a coffee mug. Yeah. <laughs> um, just, also, just see characters with different approaches to life and what they think about the outcome of the war and about different people. Uh, just, yeah, it's just nice. Characters yeah, are nice. <laughs> before Koichi goes off to work, they have, uh, Noriko and him have that conversation where. Uh, near the end, he says, don't worry, just because it's dangerous doesn't mean I'll die. It's not like kamikaze pilots. And then there's kind of a, a silence uh, mm -hmm. between them um, a bit, as I guess he kind of just realized sort of what he said and maybe wonders why he said it. Um, but then he says, in, a, in, a, in what I think is actually a, a fairly well-executed bit of a joke here, is he tells her, don't worry, I'll come back safe because we'll be using special boats that have been designed to evade mines. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and then uh, the next scene has him there at the harbor and he's just staring at these two shitty wooden boats. Yeah. But then um, it's an interesting subversion because they do evade mines because they're made of wood. Which it is exactly right. the kind of specially mines. made for that the kind of notion. Yeah. It's like, well, yeah. <laughs> It's a good yes. joke, but it has a reason. It's a joke that actually has a reason. Oh my god! Oh my god! Uh, but yeah, uh, there are there are a lot of mines that were magnetic. So if uh, a big metal ship will attract the you know magnetized mine, but they're in these wooden boats, so the mines will not uh, be attracted by their boats. And he walks onto the little dock, and he meets. Uh, we meet our our characters. We meet our we meet our boys. Uh, the, boys the gang, the lads. Now, the by lads. the way. The director said specifically, uh, Takashi Yamazaki, he said that uh, one of his influences for this movie was Jaws, um, okay, which is yeah, something, I yeah, oh, okay. I, I, almost, uh, I almost poked my dad during the movie and said, man, th this kind of gives me Jaws vibes, and then it turns <laughs> out, indeed, it, uh, it, he took well. inspiration from Jaws. Um, so we meet uh, our captain, Doc. And Kid, the captain, of course, is in, uh, is in charge of, you know, the boat. He's the boat captain. Uh, we've got Doc, who's our, uh, we'll, we'll have him, our, our, our sort of smart older guy. And then we have Kid, uh, who is uh, a you know, younger man who uh, didn't serve he in, didn't the in the war. He didn't fight in the war. Yeah. No, he didn't fight in the war. 
Um, I guess he's just too young or it happened, uh, ended too quick. So we've got our four characters now together. Well, just the nature of the job is pretty straightforward. They run out the two boats, they have uh, lines to cut the, the wires, make them float up, and then blow them up. It's just a very straightforward mm -hmm. cleanup job. But it's but, the uh, perfect we... setting. And the perfect setting for... Wait, sorry. Oh, for oh, and... meeting Godzilla. Well, like it is called say... Godzilla, after all. We get some... <laughs> We get some good characterization right off the bat for the three people that Koichi meets. Um, just the, their dispositions and personalities. Yeah, uh, the captain's kind of sarcastic and gruff. The captain's a bit of a meme, a bit yeah. of a troll. Yeah, he's a meme boy. He likes to troll a bit. Uh, and Doc is the one who tells him uh, about, you know, during the war, 60,000 mines were laid by both sides, but the worst were the American magnetic mines. Um, so that's why we've got this ship, uh, you know, made out of uh, wood that won't set them off. So he's the character who tells him that stuff with the specifics. And we'll learn, you know, later that his back, uh, you know, his, his own history is going to explain why I guess he's more, you know, keen on the science of it. And the hatching of plans. Yeah, and then, and then uh, which even brings something unique to the table because he, uh, he's the best sh shot, like, of anybody yep. on the boat. He's our sharpshooter, so that's right. That and they don't make line. that just a, he has the gun and he is good. He even tries to give some advice to the others when he's using the gun. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. uh, basically yeah. they have this, they have a clipper in the water that clips the, um, the, the metal chains, the mines rise to the surface, and then they use a machine gun on the back of the boat to shoot them from a distance and set them off. And yeah, he, he does describe, you know, being a fighter pilot, you have to know, you know, how to lead targets and things of that nature. So when you're on a ship that's kind of bobbing up and down and things are flowing around in the water, you know, it's something that would come in handy. And so he's able to be a, you know, a, a good, uh, being a good gunner. Um, and also his ability to shoot well is, is it, it's going to be used later. There are two ships. They are on the, I forget the names, but they have, they have their own ship. And then there's another sister ship that sort of goes in and out with them. Uh, so they're, they're not alone. There's them and another ship. Uh, but the, uh, the doc actually says here that he developed naval weapons during the war. So he was, um, engineer. yeah, he was an engineer. So they go out and they're shooting some mines. We get a cool Jaws esque scene. They're on their little dinghy. I don't know if dinghy has a specific. Well, this is, uh, yeah, but... this is after a couple of years. Cause it's, it's, uh, it's like, he's building up his life at home and doing the job, but now it's, uh, now it's time for good old, uh, Godzilla. To show up again and ruin everything. Um, he has a nightmare sequence uh, as well. So it seems that he's trying to... Um, yeah, the integration trying... of like the different areas of the world together. Like his memory of Godzilla plus the where he's living now. Really cool. And uh, very dreamlike. It's kind of how it goes. Well, my dreamlikes aren't super literal. Well, I mean, you could say that's a form of literal. It's just that it's it plays with your mind. There's all kinds of things at once. What does it all mean exactly? Because it's all stuff you get processed. Well, yeah, I guess well. I think, um, yeah. The, the trauma is so obviously on his mind, including because uh, it's it's just before that as well that you get the um, the kid says right. It's almost like his regrets of not being able to serve in the war. He's like, if only the war had lasted longer, and it like triggers mm -hmm. the fuck out of. Uh, oh yeah. It's main like, boy, even take that uh, back, and even Captain Troll Meme Man is like, "You fucking idiot! Why'd you say that?" Because <laughs> yeah. you know, even he has like a a social awareness of of what things to push and what not, and even you know he's gonna know like you should probably never say the war should have lasted longer. Well, the captain specifically mentions that he's not a not a fan of the imperial government. He's a uh, um, he, the, the the film has multiple characters throughout this who criticize the actions of the government. And their, you know, how they sort of treat, you know, the lives of the regular Japanese people, and you know, and and their their hiding of information. So he's pretty, he's he, he's pretty red pilled on the uh, the federal question, I suppose. <laughs> but, I mean, this yeah, film has a lot to say um, about government. It does. About yeah. youngster is that even after this, like reprimanding later in the film, he still kind of has that uh that drive and motivation of I want to fight, I want to. I want to be in like a big battle, you know. I want yeah. to prove my uh, prove my worth. That even after this, it's not like well, it's, it's not like it's dislodged the idea permanently. Yep. And that's uh, such uh, an interesting, um, almost variation on the main character's struggle, being that he's like, I fucked up my chance, or rather, my call to duty. And he's like, I want a call to duty. I want mm. a chance to be able to pull the triggers or to sacrifice whatever. 
But the, the, you know, the thing is, our main character has been destroyed by that event by not having acted. Yeah, yeah. having the chance and failing. Um, uh, the the film is definitely taking this pretty firm position that you know, don't wish for war. Don't you know? Don't be so quick to desire this. Uh, this, I guess, chance to prove yourself in that way. Uh, Which, because um, over the course of the film, it gets built up even further to like, don't be eager to to die. Like for even even for the even for the cause, right? It's like, what exactly? You're fighting for the sake of life, right? And and living and getting to live a life. So bear that in mind yourself that Well yeah, your life uh, is valuable and meaningful to you exactly. also, but a lot of people around you will be, you know, impacted as well by you dying. Mm -hmm. Um I mean we've already had, you know, the mother, you know, Akiko's mother and you know, Noriko lost her family, he lost his family. When people die, it affects those around them and exactly. you know, those who are left to, you know, carry on. So don't throw it away. It means a lot. So yeah, years go by. He makes some money. Uh, he's kind of you know, things are doing all right for him. Uh, he's becoming uh, you know better and better friends with his boat crew. Um, his relationship with Nariko kind of carries on. I think there's definitely the, the the subtle romance vibes, but he's you know they're not married yet um they are still living together taking care of the kid and akiko's definitely growing up you know she's big enough to at least you know speak a little bit and you know sit up and do all those sorts of things so uh he doesn't consider himself akiko's father but she calls him daddy mm -hmm. things like that you know it's progressing. To be her father and of course doesn't consider himself to be married He's uh, not exactly allowing that notion to uh, be present. Yeah, um, and he'll explain why uh, he hasn't married her later, and we'll, we'll get to that when we get to that. But we learn that as the years go by, things get a little bit better, you know, things get better. Uh, Noriko gets a job in Ginza, uh, working as a, like a secretary or a desk clerk, something like that. Mm -hmm. But she gets a job in Ginza, a nearby, uh, nearby city, and... Originally, Koichi's like, you know what? Don't I don't I give you enough money? Like, what what do you need a good job for? You know, don't I provide for you? Which I think is interesting because you know he feels responsible for their you know situation and everything. But she says she wants to stand on her own two feet. She wants to um she wants to kind of uh not just be given things. She wants to earn stuff. It's very woke, uh, <laughs> kind of disgusting. Uh, really really drags the film down. But I guess uh, you know. I guess we'll just have to deal with it. But yeah, yes. Noriko's got this outfit on and she's going to yeah. go get a job in Ginza. Um, so let me see. And also, uh, I believe that Sumiko is going to watch over uh, uh, the kid while they are away. So it yes. seems that the relationship between Sumiko and the rest has, has sort of improved and mellowed yeah. out over time. When it's, she's, she watches not, him for... Uh, it's just nice, <laughs> like the because it's it's a it's healing, right? And that's part of what this film is really making, trying to address the the people of Japan trying to get somewhere from the horrors of war, trying to recover. And obviously, all of this takes extreme damage again and is threatened harshly by Godzilla. Um, this this brief and tidy light in the middle of absolute destruction. Mm. So you might have been thinking that this was uh, a, a well-done little character drama that we've got, but actually it is a Godzilla movie as <laughs> yeah. well. Oh, nice. <laughs> so Godzilla does sort of enter back into the plot here. We get a radio broadcast, an announcement of some strange creature that's been bouncing around the ocean and is sort of headed towards Japan. And no one really knows what it is. No, no one really know what's, knows what's happening. Uh, the Americans are aware of it. The Japanese are aware of it. But America and the uh, Japan's militaries can't really get involved because that would um, that would trigger Soviet uh, uh, the Soviets would see that as military aggression. So again, we have our sort of post World War II explanation as to why America can't just show up with big armies to look into something. So it should be mentioned this is a problem to solve for the writer. How do we prevent yeah. the massive forces of other governmental militaries coming in to annihilate Godzilla? Uh, especially if we don't want the film to be about that. And it's like, well, you're going to have to come up with some some kind of reason, and this is the one they settled on, which I find mm. to be, uh, if I could give it a rating yeah. of like 30% uh, effective. It's something. It's, something. Um, it's not great, though. It's, it ain't great. 
I I yeah. don't I I think I would need to know more, but on its face, um, it's I, something. I, but I, it's, it's something, but, but like the justification, because the justification basically throughout the film of why America doesn't want to get involved in dealing with Godzilla is well, there's tensions with the Soviet Union um, that are making it to where they don't want to get involved. I understand that, but it's a giant nuclear powered. Yeah, if, if we can be, oh, yeah. uh, you know, a, a little bit meta, I think it works great for the theme in terms of like red tape in the yeah. government preventing yeah. the obvious help needed to the citizens. Like we don't, we just, you know, that sort of angle. Um, and and there's something that works on a character level in a way that we can make it Japan focused. I appreciate that too. But I was uh, talking and about this on focus as well. Yeah, which I was is something that talking about this on Real BBC, and I feel like a really cool solution you could have had to this would be that uh, when we hit the final battle sort of thing that uh, we have, maybe closer to the final battle anyway, uh, we have aspects of other countries, of individuals who have traveled from those countries to help because their governments are refusing sort of thing, or that there's too much yeah. red tape, too slow, the bureaucracy of it all, so we have characters Surprise that, you know, Godzilla like a British like sergeant or something with a, a couple of people, and then, uh, yeah, well, just scattered across all different kinds, obviously American and... and Maybe even throw, maybe throw yeah, just everyone from all sides of the wars. Here, you know, after the war. Well, because so. that would be an interesting angle, because obviously it's alt history to some yeah. respect. Uh, so uh, what if it was the thing where, like, the US and the Soviet Union uh, were wanting to get involved in... in that, I, I, it? Yeah, I think that really captures it. If you have Soviet and American, like, units, even though their governments have prevented them from coming, it'd be like, oh, see? That's, it uh, did it anyway, yeah. And thematically, but, the element of... Um, and uh, like Americans after the war and the Japanese working together to stop something yeah. is symbolic of like the war is behind us. We have to move ahead. We need mm -hmm. to be, you know, we could be allies now. That's, you know, not like we're not the um, people we used to be. So it's far from an absurd proposition because America was. That's what there. happened. They were on Japan and they're still in Japan. There are still bases in Japan. Yeah. Japan, Japan and America are very and strong allies. Um, allies. So, so there would have been Americans there to get involved. So yeah, I do because of course I understand the idea of wanting it to be about the civilians who were there grouping up. Like I understand that premise, but the idea that like America or Russia wouldn't want to get involved in dealing with a like nuclear powered dinosaur just wreaking havoc in Japan is a hard yeah, buy. At the, that is a at hard the beginning, buy, right? You can get away with it at the beginning when it's just a ships go missing. Yeah, but once um, it's the just some weird knows, stuff. Yeah, but once, once the, the military, military knows, knows, it's done. Once they're calling him Godzilla, you know, <laughs> yeah. it's like, oh yeah, that's like that incident that happened there, and also we're sending all these ships here, and they keep getting destroyed. Once you're at that point, I feel like the whole world is organizing around trying to deal with Godzilla. So yes. it really is like it's it ain't great as an explanation. And just, yeah. It's there, which is something. I feel like it would help if we had the individual aspect as well, because it would be so easy to characterize like an American gun toting guy being like, as soon as I heard there was a giant fucking dinosaur here, I had to see it. That sort of you know, different characters have different reasons for being here, but the representative of, of helping. Part of what sort of surprises me that there is no American character in this is that this movie doesn't say America sucks or that I mean, if anything, it's most critical of the Japanese government during the war because I mean, yeah, they, they yeah. did start it. Just they did start it, um, and it and it and it caused a lot of destruction for you know the Japanese people. So obviously, that's why you have the Japanese characters here who are just citizens, really, really critical of the government and and that sort of thing. So this film takes a doesn't take the position of you know Americans are terrible for fighting us in this war. It's like no, it's war. It, it sucks, but both things. You know, both sides kill each other. It, that, that's what's well, bad about because, it. Uh, the film tries to localize a lot on very ground level civilian perspectives rather than. Yeah, it's not a global uh, political like perspective movie. of the geopolitics. Because at that point, then you it's like, well, I mean, there's a lot of history that you have to start delving into there because the war for Japan began in 1933 um, for the, the Sino Japanese War. And if you want to go all the way back to that and then all of the invasions and all across the Pacific and everything like that. and and, and yeah, that 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 kind of doesn't help service the goals of this film in terms of being very focused on individuals and how they grapple with essentially finding meaning and moving on in the wake of the war that is very much like beyond their it's it's beyond them, beyond their control, like beyond their uh capacity to do anything about it at this point. It's yeah, post war. Um, yeah, the I, I understand them not wanting to delve into like massive politics things of like now the Cold War. 
and all of the yeah. stuff to do with like what happened what does it look like with america like i understand all that but again the idea that america or russia wouldn't be trying to get involved in directly stopping a giant nuclear lizard that's roaming around in the pacific like right near very important hot spots i mean beyond just the fact that it's a giant element that's completely out of their control it's too, that can wreak havoc on many, it's many, too many, existential many, many. this thing yeah it, it's... it is too big. Especially when we see how much damage it causes by firing its blast. It is equivalent to a nuclear bomb. It's it is equivalent insane. to the bomb. The one of, well, yeah, it's the most dangerous creature to ever live that has no allegiance whatsoever. Exactly. There's no way. And, like, e even if you assume that there was absolutely no American interest in Japan, which, of course, that was not the case. There was tremendous American and Russian in, uh, interest in Japan because Russia was yeah, going to they were enemies Japan, not part of the plan. Right, they were uh, going to invade shortly before they surrendered, I believe. Um, like Hokkaido, anyway, they just pushed them out of Manchuria. So there definitely would have been a lot of it. it, it yeah, th to to sell the idea that it's just the civilians of Tokyo having to deal with this situation with no help from their own government or the American or Russian government. I don't know about that. Yeah, That's, it's uh, uh, it is definitely a big stretch. Um, I appreciate that they at least gave a reason for it. Uh, yeah, kind of a weak one, yeah. but they did address it, and it does work like mm -hmm. in a thematic character sense. So. Well, I'd say that this is one of the few problems with the film is yes. something like this, and, and the big relevant part because we talked about this before. Generally, plot problems influence characters in a negative way. In this case, it's neutral. The characters respond to the information, and they have no control over this set of affairs. Well, this is and they world, respond right? as best they can to yeah. This uh, you could say world, and then some influence on the plot. But the there's no. I'll call it I world building that, that we argue this is what America and the Soviets are up to. I, I'd be like, that's uh, that's the world they're crafting, which I don't buy, and I don't think matches the. Sure. You know what I mean? Like, I guess uh, the idea is that it you're right, the, the plot because it motivates the civilian-led effort to uh, fight Godzilla. It's like you know, you you, you just take an episode of like fucking a normal show and then just suddenly introduce all kinds of nonsense like a doctor who episode suddenly and you just be like that doesn't make sense but if the characters react to it all as they should then there's no damage done to them which they do so yeah. it's a, it's it is a problem but it's not it's it's not that's well, it's and, not and as i said i think it's a boon to the theme too that the the government is not or outside governments sure. and inner ones there's there's a wider point of course they've been critical heavily of the japanese government uh, certainly at the time of war but also just a government in general I, I, mm -hmm. You know, like the the cold nature the government has to its civilians or uh, citizens. Yep, and it will yeah. and, pop and up that, uh, later in a few places. Well, and kind of like the notion that the government can't, the government is not really in a position to help you as an individual ascertain what your meaning of life is now in the wake of a massive war um, that they were responsible for in the first place. Anyway, that like at the end of the day, it's up to the people to figure that out for themselves. So, yeah, it's a kind of a complex mm. flaw. Um, so, anyway. Godzilla is sort of coming back into the plot. There's this awareness that there's some something out there that's kind of taken out some boats here and there, and that the wreckage of the boat sort of implies that it's moving towards mainland Japan. So that's weird. We get a scene of our crew on the boat, Koichi, Doc, Kid, and Captain, and they're out there. Uh, they're out there clipping mines, shooting them, and I, I think this is where there's a little conversation between Doc and Koichi where they kind of share a little bit of the, 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 the post-war, um, uh, I guess, I mean, Koichi is saying that I, I feel like I need to avenge them, um, you know, I feel restless, and Doc kind of says the same thing. I think he has a line where he says something a lot, something akin to, when I think about the war, I can't sleep sometimes. Or, you know, he's got his own bad memories of the war, like a lot of characters in this do. Um, so, again, we're, we're really tying in that that's a sort of common thread between characters. It's something that sort of unites people in this world, particularly uh, post-war Japan, this, this terrible memory of the war that just happened. Um, I think that this is where they bump into a um, destroyed ship. Yes. This mm -hmm. is where they yeah. come across the wreckage of a fairly and, uh, big destroyer ship out just floating quickly, out here that's been attacked. Quickly conclude, no ship did this. Um, no. That, no way a ship yeah, did this. Yeah, uh, speculation. In the, um, in the island at the beginning, they, I think one of them says, is, could this be a Yankee weapon? And then here they say a Soviet weapon. Like, there's... Mm -hmm. All that paranoia from the war, you'll always assume, it's just a, a moment away from just being obliterated by a new weapon. 
of some but kind. I said, it's, uh, no, it's they've got, got these... Koichi there who uh, recognizes some of the uh, damage on the Yeah, ship. the destroyer's got, like, bits, like, torn off of it and big claw marks like, down the side. Mark. And there's, in, in like, obviously a, a very, very large creature has attacked this ship. And uh, yeah. they buy it once Koichi says, you know, yeah, this is Godzilla. I think I saw it before uh, during the war on Odo Island. And they're like, oh, that wasn't an American attack. And he's like, nah, no, it was nope. the, the Americans never attacked Odo Island. Um, it, it was Godzilla. This thing really is real. And you can see the proof in front of you. And they believe him. Thank God. Ugh. Yeah, uh, well, so, not yeah. only that, but they start to piece uh, so, things together. Uh, yeah, they start to figure out, like, well, wait, so, wait, so what was the deal with you in World War II? Wait, hold on. Well, not just they that, the fact that they're here at all. Why are we here? Why would they have sent us here yeah, if that's oh, true? Yeah, 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 exactly. They realize, oh, shit, did yeah, I expect just... us to fight Godzilla? And no. I think, I think yeah. Doc says, like, no, they, they, they want us to stall for time until yeah. the big ship can arrive. That's right. Mm. Um, and they're they... not very happy about that because they no. have... Uh, oh, right. If you remember, they have this little dingy wooden ship that is there to destroy some mines Meanwhile, and not to find the big lizard. Yes. Well, um, I do like... Uh, like they drop some, uh, some sort of seeds here for a, a sense of bringing up and bringing down tension and stuff. They, they establish that they got a delay time for the... Is the ship called the Takeo? Ta Takeo. Takeo. Uh, yeah, something like that. Yeah. And the, so the, 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 the uh, kid is like, oh, that's fucking beast ship, legendary. And so we've, that's like a reverse ticking clock in the sense that it's like, as soon as that arrives, we'll be safe. Um, we yeah, the captain, the, the, when Doc says that, yeah, we basically are out here to let's stall for time if we can, if it shows up because it's heading for Tokyo. And the captain says, I'm paraphrasing because I'm, uh, luckily I saw this movie last night, so I remember a lot of it. But the captain essentially says that um, it's our, you know, it's our, we have to stall for time and do what we can, because if that monster is headed for Tokyo, it'll cause like immense destruction. And I think the line that I, he says is, I don't want to see it in flames again. Uh, so again, post-war, 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 it's on everything in this mm -hmm. movie. That's what the characters have in their minds. Uh, and yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So... Uh, he says he doesn't like the government and a lot of the things that they've done. He hates following orders with a passion, but he says, you know what? Someone's got to do it. Someone has to do it so that Tokyo can hopefully be saved by the time that Takeo gets here to stop it. He says, someone's got to do it, which is really interesting. I, I really like that. He's he's critical of his government, but he loves his country and his people. Yeah. And, you know, he's uh. he's got that heroic streak in him and he wants to do what's right, even if it is dangerous to him. That nuance of um, the nature of sacrifice and duty is this film's obsessed with it, and I love it. Um, Ooh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, even when the even when the kid says, "Oh, that's okay. Oh, that's a, it's a big ship. It doesn't destroy anything." You know, he has that very much idealized version of what a warship is. Yeah. That it's just this unstoppable juggernaut, and, and and once it shows up, it'll you know make all the problems go away. It's appropriate that the young uh, young guy says that. Um. So they look around, and oh shit! Um. Right after. Right after Captain says, you know, we've got a duty to do, we, someone's got to do it, someone's got to slow this thing down, Godzilla comes up from the water, He's and got he a bit of a calling this... card with the, the fishies. Yeah. The deep sea fish. Oh yeah, fish. that's right. They yeah, little... rising. It's like this little, little... Go goober fish and come yeah, up. Yeah, yeah, these <laughs> creepy little goober fish from deep down. Um, yeah, kind of rise around the surface, and, and that's kind of how you know that Godzilla's going to be showing up. Um, but we see Godzilla coming up from the water and grabbing and destroying the sister ship um, yep. of our, uh, of our, essentially our protagonists here. And they watch in horror as it just destroys the ship without any effort whatsoever. Comes up and just destroys it. And it is at this point that uh, the captain basically says, uh, yep, we're leaving. We're, we're leaving. going. <laughs> we're going. So that's a bit of a funny moment. Uh, they try to get the engine started, and they barely get the engine started in time for them to, you know, get out of the way before Godzilla comes and gets them. And here we begin our really cool ass <laughs> chase sequence. Yeah. Uh, <gasps> yeah, it's yeah, it's uh, it's cool, but Godzilla he ain't moving too, he ain't moving as fast as I figure he would uh, while chasing him. Um, I suppose not. He, it's tough to sort of catch a lot of these other ships real quick. <laughs> Compared to uh, compared to this one, he's a little bit slower. He's a little bit more tired out, like tired, I guess. 
Maybe you just woke up from a nap from all these deep sea fish. Yeah, but right. I'm saying you know it was forgetting the other ship. The other I ship. think I we're allowed to sit. We've praised the <laughs> hell out of the film, okay? There's particularly a yeah. shot where he's basically completely on them. Yeah. And just mm -hmm. they just he, they just sort of slowly move away and he's just like, hmm. Okay, yeah. yeah, all right. I'm not that interested in getting. You. I would have appreciated uh, a reason, I guess. I'm not sure how I would write this, but we need it so that he's on their tail, like he's actively trying to destroy them, but he just can't catch up. And it's like that's really hard to he's buy. To, that's hard yeah, when he's when they, and fast. When Both they start the engine, me. they just show him sort of, uh, just sort of, kind of lazily going towards the ship, and then they're able to get out of the way of it, of its spines in the water. But yeah, I I think it. It 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 takes it a more them down a considerable amount in a, in order to enable what needs to happen to happen, which is that this action scene allows them to escape while also identifying a critical weakness of Godzilla. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. uh, super engaging it's scene. Later. It's just that Godzilla yeah, needs totally. to be nerfed for this scene. Yeah. Oh yeah, he's moving super duper slow. He is uh he's going slow. He's a slow chongus today. Mm -hmm. It's it. I think it helps a little bit that we're out in the middle of the ocean, and it's tough to get a reference of how fast they're moving because there's no objects or anything to measure it against. I so it does have that kind of working for it. The things that work against it is a comparable boat we saw it get up to it without even like giving itself away because it came from under the ocean to grab it, uh, and then the ship that arrives, the one that they were delaying and waiting for, he gets over to that one fairly quickly uh, and takes it out pretty quickly as well. That, that, like, the little small boat was the one that caused him the most grief is, is a little bit funny. <laughs> um, I suppose so, because they get on the inside of him. Uh, but, yeah, we have this, we have the chase sequence, and, and what they do with a bunch of, of the mines is they've got some mines on their ship. I've and, gathered up, yeah. Yeah, and what they do is they sort of, uh, as they're fleeing Godzilla, they push the mines off the back, and then uh, Koichi on the gun, he shoots the mines and blows them up in front of Godzilla. And they're they're not really doing anything other than making them really upset. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, one of the mines, no impact at all, basically. Yeah, one of the mines they push off, and it gets in his mouth, and then Koichi shoots it in his mouth, and it like blows a chunk of its jaw off from inside. Mm -hmm. But we see that Godzilla regenerates. You know, the flesh around him really starts to regenerate, and so they're like, "Oh shit, this is bad. This is bad, mm -hmm. man. Is really bad. Oh fuck." Um, and things are looking pretty grim uh, after they watch Godzilla regenerate because they don't know what they're going to do. Which is and... interesting because it looks grim, but this is a Chekhov's mine. They've established oh my God, Chekhov's mine. I guess, I guess yep. it's more so Chekhov's Godzilla soft inner bits. Yeah, um, <laughs> that's what they call that trope. Because now, you know, Chekhov's Godzilla, Godzilla is, soft inner bits. Yeah. <laughs> Godzilla is vulnerable to damage. He is. From the outside, he seems to be utterly indestructible. But if you can get him on the inside, you can deal with some damage. Of course, the challenge is this explosion and kill him. So, doesn't look great, but he can be hurt. Yeah, after, um, uh, after that second bomb goes off, he does like square up to them like, you motherfuckers, you just blew yeah, off my yeah. face. Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> and this is the moment when the Takao shows up, the destroyer arrives, and it pelts Godzilla with its uh, cannons. Um, this this uh, this makes Godzilla very upset, and, it and looks he like moves it has some... very fast to get he to them. He, very fast, very yeah. very fast. He moves very fast. Um, he wants, to, he wants to beat him up. Yes, he's very, very upset at what has just occurred. So Godzilla goes over to the destroyer, swims right up to it, and he kind of crawls on it, and he's kind of ripping it to pieces, and his weight is making his way... I think this is one of the fucking coolest things ever, but uh, his weight is kind of dragging the ship over on its side a bit. And as the ship is leaning on its side, both of the... Uh, I guess it would be the... bow guns turn they rotate while godzilla's clinging onto the ship and they fire point blank yeah. while the ship is sort of turned over and blast it point blank and i just that was one of those movie moments for me where the visuals and the music and you were totally invested into it and i just thought it was one of the coolest things i've seen in a long time yeah no uh, it's it's a it's a really cool spectacle film um compared to again compared to something like the marbles for instance <laughs> what you didn't just, <laughs> what every everything just looks cheap and crap which is funny <laughs> considering that it costs like 20 times as much money 
Oh, it is God God so it. expensive. It is God wild. Godzilla is definitely one of those films that sort of justifies the existence of cinema and theater. As oh, yeah. It just makes you wonder when they sit in their film. little offices and talk to the movie makers like, uh, so guys, this movie over there, uh, that costs like half of the... the What's the, going on, Kevin? Hmm? Like yeah, it makes you wonder, where the where does the money go? How come yeah, you can make Godzilla word, minus well, one in uh, under 15 I mean, they, million? They, ha they have to think, like, wait, these guys yeah, um, spent like a... a Fraction of the money we spend on one episode of a, of a season, which well, yeah, that, is one, successful. I mean, what's, what's happening? One episode of Secret Invasion costs what three, four times as much as this movie. <laughs> it's insanity. Uh, we talked about it before, but oh. it's getting to the point now. I just want to, you know, I said like, yeah, if we just tweak this, put this here, change these characters here, we can get this story into the MCU in Phase Four. It's like, you know what? You've damaged it so much. I wonder now because the alternate timeline is like equally loompy. Of just tossing this movie into the MCU. Fuck it, just rebrand it marketing wise. <laughs> and like, just <laughs> just toss it in. Minus one. Yeah, fuck no it. Context. Fuck it. Absolutely fuck it. And it's oh, just yeah, like, yeah. how would that go? And it's like, probably fucking would have made loads of money. <laughs> That's yeah. how it probably would have gone. This film has, uh, I mean, in terms of like extolling the virtue of spending less money on a film, this film has like made eight times its budget. That's very and, successful. Yeah, and, and, successful, and huh? what I'm getting at, I guess, is like if it played out exactly the same, and then they're like, and the reason we've done this in the MCU is because uh, he regenerated over the course of what, 60 years or something? Yeah, or 80, maybe. But uh, yeah, yeah it's, right. you know, and, 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 and then like, yeah, he's coming back, and who's going to defeat him? And what's funny about that is like, yeah, who would fucking defeat Captain America and Falcon? <laughs> like, well, it was, oh, um... yeah, the new Avengers thing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Oh, I, was a, I was browsing on the wiki on this for a bit, and it says that um, uh, Takashi Yamazaki, the director uh, and a writer, uh, he spent three years working on the script, and it shows. Yeah, and, uh, it does show. Uh, yeah. An it actual show amount of work was script. spent on the script. Uh, he's the only listed writer, and again, he's the writer, director, and uh, visual, visual effects. effects supervisor, like, in head so of he it, was, uh, yeah, in charge. So this guy definitely had a... He had a vision, he had a lot of work put into it. And when people spend time on scripts, it tends to work out. You just gotta sit there and go through it. Um, but mm. it just, it, there's no way that you can tell me that, you know, the Marvels are, what is it, Blood and Thunder, Love and Thunder, <laughs> Love was, and thunder yeah. <laughs> was like, oh yeah, we spent three years on the script. It was like, no, you spent three weeks, may, if well, that we, much. We know that so. they don't have scripts when they go into shoot, which oh, is Oh yeah, so you're baffling. right, yeah. <laughs> I've totally it's, it's, forgot. It's unreal. Yeah. I don't understand how you can get good results when you don't have at least like things change when you make a film. Obviously, reshoots, rewrites, and everything like that. But the notion of not even having a complete script while you're that's filming, nuts. how can you, you, you watch a complete script? script? That's your story, you fuck. The beginning of a script is oftentimes what they don't even have. Yeah, they have they have a list of action set pieces that uh. someone else decided that they were going to have, and they have to figure out how to string everything together. Mm -hmm. I don't know, again, it just feels like what you have here is way more pure. It's that somebody had an idea for a story that could leverage Godzilla in a meaningful way for the characters and the theme, rather than just, well, we're just doing a Godzilla thing, so just find, find some human characters, throw them in yeah. there, and it's fucking whatever. People aren't there for them. They're there for the big lizard when it's entirely possible to have people be there for the human characters and the big lizard. And uh, Mahler, you'd mentioned this before concerning Tony Gilroy about how during the COVID, um, COVID pandemic, things were kind of slowing down, postponing how he had taken that time to look at a script and go through it. And mm -hmm. it turns yeah, out the production that was stopped, so we decided to redraft scripts. <laughs> that's that's what that's, uh... that's what happened with this movie. Uh, Yamazaki decided that well, we gotta we gotta postpone the film for a few years, and I'm going to rewrite the script several times uh, over you know mm -hmm. you know over that you know time period. It's so. rare that you do a redraft, and your conclusion is I never should have done that redraft. No, that's made it worse. I can't <laughs> I can't just default back to what I had if I did make something worse. Either. Not many people say Whereas, that. It's just, and it, fun fact as well about uh, Andor is that each of the major story arcs of the season were written by one writer. Like, one writer was responsible for each season arc. So, uh, in terms of, like, the, the, the level of, I guess you could say, like, consistency in, in yeah. the objective in any given... So, like, for instance, the first three episodes were written by Tony Gilroy. The next three episodes were written by, um, by his brother. It, it, like, that kind, of, that kind of structure, which is interesting, you know? There's definitely the too many cooks kind of philosophy that probably makes a great deal of sense when you have 
people who have competing goals and things that they want to accomplish with movies. Well, yeah, it's um, uh, it's pretty rare that you look at a film that has like six or seven screenwriters attached where it ever turns out good. Usually it's one or two people, uh, maybe three, maybe. But like, got to be on the same page, three, though. You've got to be aligned. Yeah. On a, well, on a lot of the time vision. when you have a bunch of different writers, it's because it went through a lot of different people's hands. It wasn't like four people sat together and figured out this in a script. room. Yeah, um, it's it's more like two. You know, a guy wrote a script, then someone got him to to do like a rewrite, and then someone else came in to do a rewrite, and then you got story credits and everything like that. Obviously, television's a little bit different. You got your writers' room there, but uh, but hey, we got a single unified voice through Michael Waldron for Multiverse of Madness, and I mean that turned out great, didn't it? Is that what yeah, we got? I mean, TL, <laughs> I mean TLJ is. You know, oh yeah, that was... that, that Ryan Johnson, writer director. I was actually going to say that like, feels like Rebel probably Moon. the best example of because I believe he's not like you know with everything we know about Michael Waldron. As much as I do consider him an awful writer, we also know the process was going to prevent a lot of his stuff from even making it to the screen anyway. A lot of it wasn't even his to begin with, right? A lot of it was there already, and he has to contextualize it. Not to say, of course, that his contributions weren't piss. But TLJ seems to be a film that he was given free reign on uh, for Ryan Pretty Johnson, much. and that he made the film he wanted to make. And it's like, there it is. Yeah, that's, so, that is what he wanted. When you have a production company that doesn't follow through making films they don't feel are up to their quality standards, and when you have a director, writer, who actually redrafts and you know uses his time to make the script better and tighten it up? Turns out you can get some pretty good things out of that. Uh, who to thunk? Mm hmm. So returning to the movie, um, yeah, it, this was like super amazing theater moment. Absolutely loved it. It was really nice to go back into the theater and see stuff like this. Um, I think I owe this movie, and I may be biased towards this movie because um, you love big you know, lizards. I, yeah, I mean, yeah, there's that, but, you know, yeah. being able to take my dad out again after he's been kind of home and stuff with, with his own medical issues, now that he's finally getting back on his, you know, when, when he's finally getting back out there and he can, you know, do stuff again, being able to take him back to a theater, take him to see a Godzilla movie, like this mm -hmm. big bombastic kind of theater thing that he's really keen on, and to have it be good and to be able to have something like this work and know that there's good writing behind it. Um yeah, I, suppose if, I really, really do appreciate the movie for that. Honestly. If there were one to see this year, uh, this probably would be the one I'd recommend. Not to say that I see so many in the theater these days, but uh, this is one I wanted to see in the theater, you know? Mm -hmm. And I'm glad this that is, I wasn't yeah, a waste. Amazing. This is, this is definitely a theater movie through and through. The, the way that the film uses sound and silence, the way that, you know, just the scale and grandeur of it. Um, it's, it's an excellent theater movie. There's a lot of movies that you could watch at home, you know, and you don't really lose much from it. But there are some movies where they get a well, great boost from being in that kind of environment. My film of the year, I wouldn't say you need to see it in the cinema. <laughs> You'll be fine. No. <laughs> What's your film of the year, Mahler? Same probably as everyone's here, I think. Uh, same as mine, yes. I haven't seen my movie of the year yet because it's uh, the new I... year. <laughs> oh, 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 I got oh. I'm bad at putting years to movies. I gotta, <laughs> I gotta go through like all the movies that came out last year and everything, because I'm just bad at putting dates to well, from both games and movies. Oppenheimer would be worth you uh, considering, of course, right? You like that quite yeah, a bit. Yeah, Oppenheimer. I'm cons I, I need to get like a list. I'm just fucking terrible at putting dates to things. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, Re Rebel Moon. Keep Rebel Moon in mind. mind. Obviously, yeah. Rebel Moon is up there. Oh, uh, fucking trash. Yeah. Uh, what? <laughs> That's the from the visionary Zack Snyder? The Take lyric visionary, maybe, yeah. So yeah, we get our cool-ass sequence of him, you know, thrashing the destroyer, the destroyer shooting at him, they shoot it off the ship, Godzilla's clearly not, uh, clearly not pleased with this. No. And, uh, everyone's wondering, did we do it? Did we kill Godzilla? Was that it? Well, we've got another hour left to the movie, so probably not. Mm, However... Yeah. Um, their, their fears are unfortunately realized when we see beneath the destroyer in the water into which Godzilla had sunk mm. this massive blue light and then this horrific, terrible explosion on the surface as the destroyer is, um, absolute, like, vaporized. Annihilated. Uh, absolutely An annihilated. Explosion. All of our heroes on the ship look towards the Takeo in, in shock and awe. 
Um, we have the introduction of the heat ray, as they call it, from Godzilla. Uh, and, it, and it absolutely destroys the ship entirely. It's quite um, something in this movie, the heat ray. It's, uh, I mean, it's going to be even worse later, a little well, so bit later. Let but, me get clarification. Goddamn. Is it atomic or not? I don't think it's atomic. Well, Godzilla at they, least is an atomic at this one they, because they go around with a Geiger counter later on. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, after the Ginza attack, uh, they tell people to not get around the area because yeah. they have worries about radiation. And they have those guys with the Geiger counters, that's right. And they're kind of checking for, you know, radioactive stuff. And they use radioactive buoys to check its location later. Mm -hmm. But I think the heat ray, as far as I know, it's just like an insanely big explosion that creates shock waves. I don't think it in and of itself is radioactive. Okay. Um, either That's, way, um, it's it, better for the film that it's not. Yeah. Yes, I think so. It um, it would have been fucked either, or Ginza it's, rather. Our it's main character. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's an insane energy weapon, is what it is. Godzilla right. itself seems to be somewhat radioactive. And uh, I would um, say the explosion is incredible and amazing to watch in the theater and everything. But our main characters all sitting on that boat are not that far away. No, and that would have an immense shockwave, um, considering how close they were. They're, they're lucky that their, their internal organs do, weren't turned to jelly. Do you think the fact it was underwater and we don't know how far away Godzilla is adjusts that somewhat? I mean, the, the explosion we see is, you know, the, the laser, if we think of the laser going from his mouth all the way up, and then the explosion, the impact of it is the surface of the water with the ship, and then you just mm -hmm. look at the... Uh, for lack of a better term, the graphic of what's happening. It's an enormous explosion, especially relative to the, the warship itself, which is what we see. And it's just like, yeah, that's, uh, that's big. And I think mm -hmm. our lads would be in peril for lack of a... Uh, at well, the very like least. Well, recognizes uh, later on that the shockwave uh, is, is as devastating as yeah. the, uh, the fireball in terms of the amount of damage it causes. Yeah, it's... Uh, they've got to be quite a ways away, I think, to make that uh, more believable. Well, yeah, I think that's fair. I think that's fair. Mm -hmm. uh, um, I don't know if we did a broad mention of it, but plot armor and will building are the main issues yes. I took with the film. Yeah, right, yeah. yeah. Well, yep. and this isn't the most notable instance of plot armor. There's one more left. I agree, left. yes, There's there is. one more really uh, big I, one I, left. I it, agree. And it feels as close so. as you could get to understanding the term plot armor. It feels like someone it, must uh, have been yeah, wearing yeah. some armor. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, let me see. So yeah, they wa Godzilla blows up the Takao. He checks it out. He's like, "Yeah, that's right. I blew you up." And then he descends <laughs> back. I guess I don't know. It descends back into the you know ocean and swims away. And Koichi, who got a uh, who's he's got a head wound from when he blew up the mine in Godzilla's face. Um, yeah. And he's kind of bleeding from the head a bit. Well, no, um, would, he passes would, would, out. Would you argue this is where the doctor figures out? I can't remember if it's a more overt example of, like, Godzilla's leaving now. He could continue, whatever, but he he's clearly needs to regenerate, sort of thing. Um, um, potentially, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not certain. The, the doctor intuitively, somewhat at least, uh, concludes, which I think is fair, that. Um, he can fire the laser, but he needs to needs a recharge. If you look at Godzilla after he fires the laser, he looks pretty rough. Um, yeah, but I, I don't know if I that's get, a combination like a, of being underwater or the I guns like. that hit him. I like that when Godzilla fires this laser, it kind of hurts Godzilla. He's got these scars on his outside that he's not not even he's kind of immune, so to speak, to his own heat ray. That it 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 takes a lot for him to do that, and with all the resources that that the doc would probably have. Uh, especially with what happens at Ginza and stuff, um, I think he'd be able to piece it together reasonably. Yeah, I was, um, I was just thinking out loud about whether I, I or not that so, was yeah. where he spotted it. Does he have that same level of uh, degeneration after firing a bit later? Um, I think so, but I'm not certain. I, I, suppose I, I remember him the looking pretty. On his outside might be from the the destroyer hitting him. Maybe that's what I was saying. But it might be a combination. That of might be true. All those yeah. things. I see. Um, let's see. Um, nothing in particular happens through the next minute, as the case is. Um, but yeah, he wakes up in the, he wakes up in the hospital, and his crew's there, and they're very glad that he's alive. Um, he's obviously you know Koichi's banged up a bit. Um, when they figure out uh, that they, they want to tell people that this monster is heading towards Tokyo, right? The the four of them do. 
but you know they've been told that uh, the the government isn't telling people because they don't want to incite panic um, and chaos. For which the captain is like, "Oh, there there goes our government, you know, hiding information again." Uh, something that he'll reference again. There are times where something like that might be fairly applicable, as in, like, we don't want to tell the people... I'm trying to think of, like, a really ridiculous circumstance where telling everybody about the thing literally would only make everything worse, but, you know, this instance of giant lizard monster and telling everybody they would just panic, it's like, I wonder if... I wonder if that's actually just overall Um, better, though, if they just... (laughs) They collectively tried to escape. You know what I mean? Because they're not, they've not got, like, significant plans to do anything in particular with Godzilla. Um, and there's also the element of what do they really know about it at this point? It's a creature that can destroy a battleship. Um, who are the witnesses, you know, that are left? What did they say? What does the government think of it? Do they still underestimate its capabilities? There's I can understand hesitation on, yeah. on basically announcing there's a giant monster that's yeah. going to kill you all. But but the people who saw it in person think that Tokyo should be warned. But you know, there's the gag order on it, and Captain doesn't like that, and you know, Doc doesn't as well. It's definitely it plays into the whole thing of the of okay. the government treating uh, Japanese lives too cheaply. Um, so um, when uh, Koichi returns home, uh, he I think this is the scene where he explains to Noriko. You know his his past his trauma. Shame. His yeah, his shame. He his mm-hmm. kamikaze pilot. He couldn't do it. Um, he froze up when he could have you know shot the monster with the guns, and he just couldn't do it. It led to people dying. He's got the photographs of the men who are dead, and it is something that he carries around with him. It's a terrible weight, and he has nightmares. Um, you know he relives that moment, and he's wondering if he actually is dead, and this is. You know, just the, the, the remnants of memories of a dead man, and he's just sort of walking through life as a ghost in a way, um, in, in, in this vain attempt to I sort of, you know, sort of redeem himself. Um, mm. it's, a really, it's a very emotional and deep scene where he finally opens up to Noriko about, you know, stuff that's been on his mind. And it informs later when he explains why he, you know, didn't it's, um, marry, he, he wouldn't marry her. A lot of conventional writing advice would likely be, don't make your main character a coward don't make him fail his duty don't make him get people killed because he couldn't pull the trigger or sacrifice himself that's people going to struggle to like your main character if you do something like that but man the this is the kind of writing advice i way prefer which is like there is no kind of characterization that's off the table it's just uh different levels of difficulty to get people to endear toward the character going forward and they do so much to help you understand him and to um and i and I, I think the being a coward and being brave, these things are very much on a spectrum for like being able to sympathize with it and understand it. A, a father who won't protect their child from an attacker, right, and who runs away is different than, you know, Koichi's situation. You know, at the end of a war, he, he's a kamikaze pilot. Maybe he doesn't, you know, and he doesn't go through with it. You know, the totally different, you know, elements of, you know, cowardice and not well, yeah, doing and, you know, what you should do. A lot of so, stories comment on the line between stupidity and bravery. It's like, there's some choices where it's just like, what are you doing? That's, there's just no reason to do that. And I think that that was implied somewhat on the... Uh, on the that, boat that, with the captain, yeah. Well, and the mechanic talking to him in the beginning, saying like, yeah, why, why die? That too as well. Yeah, so, we've had multiple instances of that sort of being brought up. I mean, like a... You know, the captain said, you know, we got to do our, you know, do what we can to stop this from getting Tokyo. I can't bear to see it in flames again. And then they see the other ship get eaten and he's like, nope, we can't do anything. There's nothing we can do. We're leaving. And it ends up saving their lives. So, uh, yeah, it's just this, again, you get these persistent thematical elements in this movie of, you know, bravery and sacrifice, patriotism, you know, the value that life has. Mm -hmm. Don't throw it away. Um, You know, if you're going to, if you're going to spend your life, you better, you know, you really need to make sure that that's a decision that you don't take lightly um, and make sure you do it for the right reason. Mm. Don't do it for some sense of honor, but that comes from, you know, very real things that you should be aware of. It's not just the performance, but the informing people of his, the weight that's on him, the almost monologues about how he feels like he's not even alive or that uh, this sense of what he would deserve to have as a life now going forward. But also even those, uh, those pictures him hanging on to those, knowing that he's he's got them, 
just says so much about him, and it makes us all be like, oh, man. You know, instead of instead of being like, I don't like this guy, he's a coward. Why would I like any coward? It's, it's more so just like, no, I I mean, the first one, the second one. You're just like, uh, it's, it's, he's not too far separated from any normal person at all. Like, completely, uh, it, the film helps you endear toward him because you, you understand why and how he's ended up here. And uh, if you've watched movies before, you're almost preparing yourself to be like, I wonder how this will all turn out. I wonder where this mm. man will end up, and you get particularly interested, I would imagine. It's just, um, yeah, the main thing I just wanted to say was just that this, this could act as a response to the notion that you shouldn't have a cowardly main character slash character who fails in their uh, their duty, their honor, their responsibilities as a almost primary trait, which is a lot of what informs him for a long time in this film. If writing has rules, then maybe rules are meant to be broken. So, that's well, a good rule. The, well, good, that is, the writing rule is rules are meant to be broken. There you go. When it comes to subversion, that is the uh, the rule. Make sure you understand why they were put in place before you break them. That's, yeah, that's really yeah. Straightforward. It's like if you're going to parody something, make sure you understand what you are parodying. Well, and um, why would conventional wisdom tell you to have a brave main character no matter what? It's like, oh, well, because we, it's much easier to make people like root for that character. It's yeah, like, oh, it's so heroic, and you can link up with them, and you if can I root make for them, them, and you really feel like you're behind them, yeah. If I make them non-brave, then I need to provide alternative avenues of understanding and reasons to support the character. It's like, yes. That's, that's right. True. Like, Koichi's continuous, like, he, he blames himself. He feels he feels terrible about what he did. And it's a, it's a, I mean, like we had with the nightmare sequence of him walking out of his house, and then he's back on the island watching all the mechanics on Odo Island get killed yeah. by Godzilla. It, like, it, this is a weight that he's carrying around with him. I mean, they even say, they say the war has not left him. Uh, he hasn't. He hasn't finished his war. I think they say. So, having a scene here where finally he can open up to Noriko and she can once again tell him that you know living is an important thing to do. Um, my parents wanted me to live. You know that's the thing that keeps me going. We have to stay alive for the people around us. Your life is value. Um, you know, and it, it, it really shows a deep connection between the two, and he's definitely being uplifted by not just his crew on the boat, who are, you know, his friends, basically, at this point, but also Noriko. And that contrasts with earlier, with uh, Tachibara, the mechanic, uh, that survived on the island, and with um, Sumiko originally, when he returned home, kind of, you know, cutting him down. Um, he, he's starting to, you know, see the other perspectives and and, and kind of learn, but he's still definitely carrying a, a, a lot around with him. And also, I, I'm really glad that this movie shows that you can have a man who can just, like, cry, who can, mm -hmm. like, break down, who can let his emotions out, who can... He doesn't just bottle it all up and become self-destructive in his own way. He can actually be willing to express that and still be a, you know, a, a brave and heroic character. Um, I really appreciate that a lot for this, because uh, a lot of people over here, a lot of people in a lot of movies and stuff... You know, they, they, they seem to be terrified of the idea of having an emotionally vulnerable uh, protagonist, particularly a male one. Um, so it's good to see that this film has a very complex and interesting main character who's super believable and that gives us something to empathize with. And uh, uh, building yeah. up what's going to be the catalyst for his change, or rather it's a change of action, but... You know, even just continuously seeing this family that he's built through complete and utter circumstance, like it's uh, something that he's going to gradually want to protect more than anything. After the scene with him and Noriko, he you know goes to bed. He wakes up. He sees uh, her and Akiko, and he's just like, "Yep." There, you know, I, I, we get that scene where he's really kind of glad that they're around and that he can be, you know, I guess there for him, be a provider, you know, have them as a responsibility. Um, this idea that he he does have things and people to live for and to fight for. Um, so it's it's that little kind of uplifting sort of thing of that them growing closer as a family. Godzilla, mm. you know, remember he was heading towards the mainland after the last time they saw him in the ocean, and sure enough, he arrives. You don't get a lot of time in between these two attacks. Nope. Um, this is very much a Godzilla movie. So uh, we uh, learn uh, on the radio, I believe, it's um, Koichi is at home with Akiko, and the radio says that the basically the monster is headed towards Ginza, 
Wait a second, Ginza, that's where Noriko got a job. Oh, Women no. should stay at home and raise children. <laughs> oh, man. So they don't die. And then we get uh, a very terrifying long sequence of Godzilla destroying Ginza. Yeah. Um, and it really uh, has it in for that train she's on. <laughs> He yeah. really does. Um, I, I, he really is. She is in the wrong place at the wrong time. Let me tell you. Godzilla shows up. He's trampling around through Ginza. He's tearing down buildings. He's stomping on cars. He's eating trains. She. Was this um, the first um, part of the film where they play the OG Godzilla theme? Or did I they think play so. it? Early? I think so. I remember I noticing right. it here for the first time. Yeah, by the way, it's cool. Oh as fuck. shit! It's cool yeah, the as Godzilla fuck. Yeah. Awesome. This um this movie has a really great soundtrack um and it it's it seems like it's one of those soundtracks or it feels like it's one that was made very much in tandem with the director and the storyboarding um it doesn't seem like this is a random soundtrack that's just sort of stuck into a movie so, um, um the the use of the Godzilla theme is very I think they only play it maybe three or four times in the movie it's very restrained yes, I think it is yeah, restrained um, but boy it, it's hard. People- Oh yeah, it does. Because I think it's the one shot where it's like it's sweeping up from like the ground level as Godzilla's there doing his sort of like the classic walk through the city, and it's just blaring through the speakers. It's um, it's super impactful. It's a cool it theme. Is, it's a it's a crazy good throwback to the old you know Godzilla stuff. There he is. He looks amazing. He's yeah. got that old school look to him. We got the old music. He's here terrorizing the city. It is uh, boy. It's you gotta see him running around knocking buildings over. That's his thing. That's yeah, right. That's what he does. And he does. There's a, couple, there's a couple of cool shots as well from farther away when where you could where they show you how well heavy he is. Like he yeah. steps down and then like a split second later it just goes into the concrete ground and you see like people getting flung up into the air because they were like close yeah. to it. Yeah, like, that was crazy. He when he steps, yeah, it, the the surrounding concrete kind of lifts up, and so yeah. there's people that kind of bounce a bit on it. Um, it's really like you get, like it you you buy it 100 uh, percent that he's walking around destroying stuff, and then you're yeah, then there's that little voice in your head that's whispering under 15 million dollars, and then you're wondering <laughs> yeah. how the yeah. fuck it all then happened. There's, uh, there's also like the vision of of Floompy Godzilla running in that trailer. Running yeah, but he's on his way to save the day, okay? I've seen right before I've seen this. I was like, oh, that's <laughs> two different worlds, isn't it? They gotta By make the way, sure that Kong gets the Infinity Gauntlet. It's gonna be great. Oh, no. Everything from the trains to the buildings to the cars, uh, all the clothes people are wearing, it's got an incredible mid-40s kind of look to it. Yeah, mm. yeah. Um, I think that, uh, like I said before, I, I really like it when we do period stuff. When we go to different time periods, when things kind of look kind of things looked a bit different, and everything here from the technology to the clothes and the way everything looks, it's just it's a great it, it just it's great imagery, and I really really love it. He's you know stomping around, you know, tearing down buildings. You even get the guys doing the radio broadcast on the roof. Oh my God, he's destroying the the Nippon Theater, you know, cultural icon of our city. Yeah. Oh yeah, they they had town. some balls to just be. Very f- fucking close to. It. I was immediately yeah. like, I wouldn't be there. Sorry, I'm out. Like, yeah. yeah. Um. So the all that stuff. Yeah. The the Japanese radio broadcast as he going through credit. It's it's great. It's it's really great. Um, yeah, it's a cool scene. Uh, there are people running away in terror. All that good Godzilla stuff. Um, we just fuck so, up that building. They are like right next to him. At one point, like like a oh, yeah, is away from the roof doing the uh, yeah. doing the broadcast. Like, like oh yeah, Godzilla's right there, and it's like, guys, you're dead. Like, you're gonna die. Talk about Run courageous away. versus stupidity. <laughs> it is definitely yeah. yeah. There's I think there's like five of them, and he's yeah. I even I think he says he's like oh he's walking right past us. His head is right next to us. He's so dangerously close. No. Um, it's like um, do you remember in the Simpsons when Ken Brockman was reporting on the uh, you, you know how like all of the big um mascots and everything in the Treehouse of Horror came to life. It was like that one. Yes. You remember where, like, Kent Brockman, the Kent Brockman one on the sign in the background comes to life, <laughs> walks off to him and eats him. Wait, does he eat him or does he, like, crush him? I, I want to see. The point being. I think he gets one of those two, yes. The point being, that's dedication to the craft right there. Yes. Mm. He needed to give the best news report possible. 
kind of reminded me of um you remember in like the the steven spielberg war of the worlds how like everybody was like gawking at the uh the tripods which um no way get the <laughs> fuck out of there why would you gawk at them they're obviously like do you think that they're there to say hi and shake hands and be chill it's a giant Wait, war machine are you actually highlighting that as an issue oh well i understand that people would do it i'm just saying i wouldn't do it <laughs> No, way. I can't actually. I so I know that I would want to be running away because, especially when I'm watching a movie. But right, the nature of a right tripod, there. like this, it, this is the same kind of thing with Godzilla. I don't know that I'm immune to the absolute stunning shock of seeing something that I can barely comprehend in terms of its absolute mm. size. It's I one wonder... of those things that you you don't you don't know you until, don't it know happens until it happens. Because right. there Which are... fortunately never will. But, the, you know. There well, are there <laughs> are a lot it. of the, there's a lot of like um footage of you know people being around something crazy happening and they just freeze up and they don't do anything yeah totally i'm, so not, I'm it, not saying it's a floor at all like this is um, yeah it's it it's makes definitely do you remember um yeah yeah independence day i think that's in the first act right when they arrive and all the people oh, when like, they all uh looking at the ships before they blow up all the landmarks i, I kind of want to rewatch independence day i want to remember how good it is i know red letter media uh, think it's shit I mean, I would it's see Roland it Emmerich, too. so, you know, <laughs> Roland Emmerich doing his Roland Emmerich things. End of the world, baby. I remember that it was, um, because, uh, wasn't there the, there was the thing, right, where the, they blew up and, and, uh, Will Smith's wife was in the tunnel, and then, like, the dog jumps through the open door and the flames just sort of roll past instead of going into the tunnel. Hero dog makes it, yes. That's right. Yeah. What's your complaint there that the hero dog? No, lives? no, no. I'm, I'm okay. Up. I, I'm, I love that the hero dog lives. It's, it's more <laughs> yeah. so that the hero dog would withstand the flames, but I don't know about the lady or anybody else who was hiding <laughs> in that area. You know, yeah, the hero I gotta, dog would just set up a force field. To protect it's been himself. a long time since I've seen that, so I'd have to, I'd have to see it again. But I know the scene you talked that, about. It's almost like slow mo when the dog jumps, right? Yeah, that's right. Because I mean, those miniatures were cool as fuck. Like the min the oh, I love the way the UFOs look. The white hats and everything. As well, yeah. yeah. I Super remember cool. the inside of the UFOs. They have when they, like um. When they play that clip to the president in Austin Powers, he says, "Actually, that was just footage from the movie Independence Day, but the real one will look a lot like that." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, that, that had a lot of cool, because again, that was 90s, you know, so that was the era when visual effects were coming in to augment a lot of traditional techniques rather than completely replacing them. Anyway, Godzilla. That other one that nobody watched, yeah, it's tough to really to talk about that. Godzilla. Yeah, it's tough to really uh, say more about that other than it's an incredible sequence of Godzilla going around uh, destroying stuff. As far as yeah. our characters are concerned, <clears throat> mm. uh, <laughs> So, oh boy! All right. So, as far as our characters are concerned, Noriko, um, through through a through a through a potentially believable sequence of her falling into water after the train car that she's in gets picked up, and like, okay, okay, um, she's uh walking through the she she is walking through the streets now as um Godzilla is trampling everything in sight, and she gets knocked down by the the crowd as she tries to get away, and then luckily. Who should come by to help get her up and save mm -hmm. her? It's Koichi. He made it. He came from Tokyo and he found her and he's Somehow. rescued her. Which, um, um, I don't know, in the middle of... Because I presume that this is an area that's part of, like, Tokyo Metro. Um, I presume it's I don't actually know, uh, but either way... I figure if like, she's going to work there and they don't have a car, it's probably within... The point being, it's a big city. She takes um, the train, it's part yeah, of the city. So, yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 right, right. Um, takes that train car. I don't know... It'd probably be hard to find any individual uh, amidst all those people and all that um, chaos. Amidst that chaos, yeah, it would be especially if she's somewhere she normally wouldn't be. Wouldn't be. Like she yeah, she's she's not like she meeting up with him in no, any that's, significant that's, area. To be clear, that's that's the road she always runs from Godzilla on. Oh. So it makes sense <laughs> that, that he would go right, there right. to. Yeah, it, that makes sense. Um, but uh, but it's but, it's no big deal. They bump into each other. Yeah, they're, they're, like, he's at least they've shown that he knows that there's something headed towards Ginza. He is on his way, and he does the you know he puts himself in danger to save. He's her, doing hero so. shenanigans. That he is doing hero shenanigans. Credit for. Look at him go. So yeah, lucky that he found her. But I I guess he did. So fair enough. Um, uh, then we get a sequence of we we get the. Let's see. I think this is where they show kind of the the process of of charging up. Yeah, yeah, of of charging up. Godzilla. It starts in his tail, 
and his little back spines kind of glow blue and stick out a little bit as he's charging up his heat ray. And yeah, everyone's like, holy shit, what the fuck is happening? Oh my goodness. They're saying this in Japanese, of course. Um, and <laughs> then um, Godzilla <laughs> Godzilla uses his heat ray in, in this, uh, on the city in front of him. He charges up, rears back his head, and then he... You know, it, it, it's a quite a spectacle, and it's not just the sight of it. You get the blue ray coming out of the mouth. Mm -hmm. You get the atomic looking shock wave, an explosion. You get the, you get, you know, the energy radiating off of it. The um, the everyone. trail from his mouth to the destination, for lack of a better term, where it's like it throws things up, but it also it kind of kills around. It's the mm -hmm. the laser, and yeah, of course, just there's so many things to praise at once, but um. I don't know how to describe it. The spines expanding, uh, almost with the charge up of the energy of his tail. It's just cool as shit. Which is an yeah, alternative yeah, version uh, of the one that you know. There's so many ways you can portray that. The um, the one we've seen a lot more recently, I guess, in the Western version is that it it charges up like a light. It's not like the tail does the chunk thing with each of the spines, but it's just I don't know. It's a very aesthetically satisfying element that helps build tension, I suppose. Is uh, I'd like say so. I like it more uh, than yes. just the glow up sort of tracking yeah, along really with the cool. gutting, like the chunk. Ch like it's, it makes a loud thud. It's a nice, like, punchy sort of movement and sound. It's cool. I like it more. It's very than, cool. Uh, and it's the, it's. the running theme is that this is way better than Western Godzilla. <laughs> That's the running seems theme. It's not even close. It's uh. just the execution of a cool idea because then we get the shockwave going out and then we get the shockwave coming back in. It's almost mm. like he's vaporized all the air. So the energy expands everything and then everything rushes back to fill that vacuum again. It's really, it's really harrowing and terrible and terrifying and awful. Um, now, uh, um, <laughs> now let's have a chat about plot armor. Uh, <laughs> I, I, love, I love this movie a lot, but boy, I really fucking hate this part kind of, because I feel <laughs> it's like it's so out of place. Um, Godzilla <laughs> well, uses his heat <laughs> Yes? <laughs> why don't you walk us through it, then? Yeah, go well, for it. Love, I would, I'd love to walk awesome. you through go. this thing I hate. Um, <laughs> so, Godzilla uses his incredible, insane heat ray. And you're in that theater, and you are just, oh, the hairs are standing up on the back of your head. Um, and everywhere else, because, of course, I'm, I'm a dog, so I'm covered in it. Of course, staying in character. And then you get the big old shock wave. Oh no, you can see the shockwave coming. Debris and building bits and rubble, it's all flying towards Koichi and uh, uh, in, uh, Noriko. Oh no, what will they do? Well, Noriko, seeing all of this stuff, this terrible shockwave heading towards them, she pushes Koichi into this alleyway and out of the blast. And then she is unfortunately caught by the blast and she flies back um and then a reference gets in the look of the visuals back. the buildings are disintegrating um yeah. it is everything well if we're gonna skip to that like the the attack would be how the hell oh, we didn't need to talk about her yet i guess we can later but th she's covered in the talk of how would our main character survive this? It's like, well, the building stood strong, the ones he was between. You're like, well, how did they stand strong the, when the uh, buildings that are 10 meters in front of them got obliterated? Mm -hmm. Well, no, because the building was behind Godzilla, so Godzilla shielded the building I, from the block. I think I'd have to I look think that's what you're wonder... actually meant to... I think that's the best you could do, is that the, yeah. the building was... But the problem is that like, I don't the think shockwave so. was... I think I'm pretty sure that when there's the big wide shot of uh, the carnage, that it's like the building that he was behind, and maybe one more in front of him was like behind where Godzilla was, <laughs> and <laughs> apparently shielded him from the uh, from the explosion. Yeah, I think that's, I'd have to. I think that's what they I, want you to believe. I'd have to look at it again to see where he is in relation to Godzilla in the buildings, and if there's like diminishing damage over a certain time, it's. Because they cut away uh, a couple times to show destruction, and I can't really get a good gauge of the distance. Because they don't show, like, Koichi and Godzilla in the same shot. Oh, sorry. Um, I think all that happens is that you add one more variable, which is that... Uh, oh, you, you're just pushing... You're kicking the can down the road just a little bit, which is... Oh, so the shockwave was so massive that it caught, um... It caught, uh... Uh, Noriko, uh... 
in the in the blast, but only maybe five, six feet away in the building that didn't get disintegrated, he was fine. It's like, wow, I, shit, that's lucky, ain't it? I, <laughs> I think, I, I guess I was under the impression when I watched it that they were getting all of the rubble and crap that had been destroyed closer to the explosion, and it was now flying all past them and through, you know, everything there. So it was almost like the 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 city shrapnel was now getting thrust back. And it well, wasn't and she like was the getting buildings. thrust back along with the shockwave as yes, well. But yeah. again, you basically just have to accept that Koichi managed to survive miraculously and luckily when he should have been killed. Yeah, I think everyone well. everyone's um, willing to concede that she should be gone. Everybody, There's no way. She, she should be to, totally yeah. dead. I, I can oh, buy yeah. Koichi living. Um... But I, I, I don't know. That's <laughs> no, like some I need... bullshit. I, th I think it's the worst part of the film. I think it's like the the biggest thing that you can is, point yes. to is like an obvious flaw, which is that this is ridiculous plot armor for him and her, as it turns out. Um, um, I'd probably insane. even say Let's worst again, element sure. of the film as opposed to part, because it makes it sound like it's more than just this significant plot armor. Because the rest of the scene is great. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Oh, sure, sure. Uh, yeah. They, yeah, I, I And agree. what they Hers. do with this afterward, the idea of him surviving yes. and her dying, and, like, the transformation that that creates in Koichi of, like, it, it, it basically sets in motion a new attitude towards what he has to do to redeem himself, one that's a lot more um, self-destructive, uh, which will obviously mm. be rebuked by uh, several characters in the film by the end. So you've got that, which is, which is, which is, like great as is a thing that's setting up, but like, fuck me, the plot armor in this part is it's pretty ridiculous. Strong. Well, yeah. and, and, and um, on the note of kicking the can, like no matter what you can come up with for how he miraculously survived, be it the particular strength of the building or the location of it behind Godzilla, or that it was just far away enough, or whatever, it's like all of these would be hyper coincidental. None yes, of it, none of it is on purpose from the character. Yeah, that they were behind Godzilla rather than in front of Godzilla to the sides of Godzilla that they just happen to in the midst of the chaos find themselves in just the- the fact that the- the only character in the world who has encountered Godzilla twice and lived to tell the tale about it found himself in just that right position to be spared from the blast so that he could continue to be involved in the fight against but Godzilla I with critical do, information and insight, you know? I do love and appreciate that she would push him out of the way of the- what she perceives as the primary force of damage, which is yeah, still and, worth it. and of course it, uh, mm -hmm. it closes the door on something that was an element that was, you know, part of the discussion throughout the beginning of the film, which is, or the first half of the film, you should say, which is, what's the deal? Like, why aren't you, why aren't you fully embracing, essentially, that this is your life, that she's your wife, that this is your child? Why yeah. aren't you doing that? And now the door's closed, she's dead. When that's obviously, well, as far as he's aware, and that's obviously what he wanted, that's obviously what he needed, and with that door closed, that now sends him down a much more destructive um, and cynical path. Yeah. Which, we, we, so yeah, it's, it's, yeah. Sorry, go yeah. for it, Metal. Oh, yeah, just because the, the next scene is when they uh, have like this little grievance uh, as a family slash friend group, I guess. You I guess say. For, yeah. I get, or, before you do that, I, I just oh, yeah, want to say, yeah. like, incredible acting by the, uh, yeah. the protagonist, how he's oh, sort yeah. of shocked yes. when she's dead, and how he just mm -hmm. yells in this very primal anger at Godzilla as it just walks away through yeah. the rubble. Yeah, because uh, it's way indifferent to the damage that it's caused to him. How much he fucking hates Big Lizard right now. It's, uh... Yep. Well, it's just now, now it's complete. You know, Godzilla as what he represents is absolutely complete, which is that Godzilla is the physical embodiment of um, Koichi's remorse and guilt over right. his 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 perceived cowardice, uh, whatever misgivings and grievances in general that he has with the war, of, of which there are many, uh, the fact that it claimed his, his family, that it put him in this position in the first place. Uh, obviously, the fact that Godzilla has now killed um, Noriko, as far as he's aware, it is just like the looming, walking specter of his guilt which is awesome what a cool idea yep. for using godzilla as a component in your film that's how it should always have been instead of just big lizard runs around mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yep because it doesn't have to be a stupid silly monster movie it could be like a meaningful emotional um you know a thematic monster movie uh so yep well, it just, just makes it way more interesting to want to destroy it beyond because of course you already have the obvious layer of why you want to stop Godzilla. It's a big monster, he kills people. 
That's yeah, well, I was rooting for him in King of the Monsters, though. Yeah, uh, but in this uh, one, well, I'm yeah. rooting for I'm rooting for the people. God forbid. But that's the thing is, that uh, not so only do you have that. just the the clear conflict of we need to stop Godzilla because Godzilla is destructive, he's killing people, he's a danger to us all. But now we've built on top of that extra layers and elements that are making us particularly invested in seeing Karichi, uh, Koichi uh, fight um, Godzilla and uh, and beat him. You know, and it, it's just that's the way you do it. That's that's a way better way of doing it. Take advantage of the material that's in front of you. You know, Godzilla is yeah. a cool idea. It's a cool idea. It's a cool monster. I like the big lizard. Um, but you can make him into more than just a big lizard that you have to stop. He can become something symbolic to the main character and really to right. everybody. It's good shit. Um, yeah, like uh, it, it's the thing that you had mentioned earlier. You you talked about it a lot when we were watching She Hulk. Um, you know, tra- degrading the things that you are using. Oh, um, yeah. Uh, Daredevil's yellow costume where it's like you're going to use it as an advertising point for your shitty show while shitting on the creators who made way more impactful and meaningful things than you did. It's like it's, they're uh, afraid to be serious about something. And I they're afraid that. to be earnest and they're afraid yeah. to be honest. Is what it is. They can't they can't they're not comfortable enough presenting their story to the world for what it is and what they want it to mean that they have to load their entire story with, hey, look, but this is silly, right? Yeah, it's pretty ridiculous. Yeah, keep right? winking, <laughs> wink at the wink, audience. Wink, We're judge. with you guys. We know yeah, how silly this is. We're with you guys. Mm. And, and then it's just like, cool, you're just like cutting... What is it saying? Like cutting off the... You're cutting off the potential that your kind story of, yeah. has to like make the biggest impact possible because you're... You, you don't even believe in it, you know? And if it's you like, don't believe um, in it, how can you convince the audience to believe in it? Yeah, it's like, it's like when we were watching... Uh, Deadly Night was the the Santa Violent movie, Night. and they burn the sack. Violent, Sil- Night. Violent Night, and they burn the sack. And I'm like, oh, you've just removed that from the plot. You've 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 made a decision. You've drawn a line. That thing that you could have mm-hmm. done, you can't do that anymore. And like, okay, well, I mean, all right, we're not taking this seriously. Okay, I, I, it'd be nice for you guys to take something seriously. I mean, you're spending mm-hmm. hundreds of millions of dollars on it. You mm-hmm. can take it seriously, but if not, I mean, it's your money. It's fine. It's whatever. You know, you, you did. Yeah, we were more money. than ready to take seriously Santa fucking up a bunch of people because they're ruining Christmas. Hell yeah. Yeah, but instead, oh, whatever. Um, we so we see the destruction of the city. Uh, we kind of get the implication that, you know, Godzilla's radioactive. They're looking to study mm-hmm. him, looking for little pieces of him that might have fallen off. Uh, tens of, you know, a lot of people, tens of thousands of people are dead or, you know, wounded from the attack. It's a really big deal. And we we have a scene where, you know, it's it's very sad. Noriko's dead and... There's the, you know, sort of a funerary, um, you know, event going on at the house. And, you know, Akiko wants to know where mommy is. And um, mm, and that's pretty yeah. devastating. Hearing yeah, that. yeah, it's and they try to lie to her, sad. but she yeah, knows she, she, she go, knows that something's wrong. Has to go back to work for a while. It's like, yeah, oh. yeah. Um, but the child isn't buying yeah. it. He goes there and all of the, his friends from the boat are there. So yeah, it's really rough and it's very sad. It's definitely uh, the low point after we see the destruction. That very yeah. real element of yeah, what you saw was really fucking cool uh, for a movie, but it is terrible. A lot of people died, and you know, yep. people are very sad because of that. Um, and then and- our main character goes uh, over. It's like, man, that's my fault. And I think he's looking at the uh, at the pictures of the fallen soldiers. I think so. I was like, oh, my fault. You, you... He's basically seeing this as a curse, like he was cursed with this. And now because he thought he could, uh, I think he says, could dream again or can live again or something like that. No, no, yeah. he took it away from me because I actually don't really deserve this. Like, I don't know what I was thinking by actually trying to embrace this. Yep. Well, Bill is there to torment him. He hasn't, he hasn't yet fully completed his transformation into who yeah. he needs to be to move on with his life. Godzilla, <laughs> as a representation and manifestation of his guilt, is still yeah. looming. I don't know if it was here or a little bit later when he s- says to one of the guys, like, I'm not actually back from the war yet, mm-hmm. uh, basically. Yeah, well, my war's it's... not over, right? My yeah. War's... Hence, uh, yeah. hence I, think, I think that is what Godzilla minus one means. Mm-hmm. I, think, I think that's got to be it. Is the notion that him and, by extension, kind of everybody in the country is not quite back from war. They're not quite yeah. where they need to be. We, They're we, still laden we get those with the implications uh, pretty, pretty soon, I think. I think when we have to, uh, uh, what was the the uh, public plan 
or like the mm-hmm. plan they do. Yeah, Doc tells him that he's been that he's been working on something. Which um again, yeah. this is a further continuation of the America, Russia, and the Japanese government. They don't want to get involved, which nope. you just gotta accept that. Yeah, I feel like it. at this point at this point when a city's been destroyed, yes. um I, I'm I'm yes. pretty sure that the yeah. Americans can go up to the Soviets and be like, well, we've... Okay, listen, this thing uh <laughs> first off, it's on your side. <laughs> so uh, let's get that clear. Uh, but yeah. we need to stop this thing. It's blowing up cities. But uh, well, I, this, I still uh, think they're uh, they're running with the Soviet stuff. Part of the be- <laughs> the benefit of an alien invasion or a giant creature on Earth would be that it would probably be the most uniting event in the history yes. of Earth. Probably. Um, yeah. Nothing if you had us together like an existential threat. If you had a goompy, you know, army of aliens that were about as easy to defeat as the space dogs in Infinity War, except like one big mastermind type alien that we could kill with. You know, Independence Day style, the whole world, like, they'd have the attitude of, we kill each other, you don't get to kill us. That's how that works, okay? And that we would, in that moment, unite so fucking hard and have all these networks and uh, relationships that would have been built from it. And in a sense, you know, that would be kind of a cool movie to make as well. And Godzilla could absolutely play that role. Oh, yes. That's a great unifier, yeah, that uh, everybody unifies to oppose him. It's 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 after the the fact that Godzilla has essentially now very publicly demonstrated himself to be a walking like he can just essentially create new Hiroshima's wherever he goes. You figure that at that point, especially after just having the world having seen the absolutely devastating power of an atomic bomb, that this would be the point that they'd go, all right, guys, we got to get involved, but mm. they don't. So that just leaves us with essentially the way that the film wants to go, which is a civilian-led yes. operation, which I like the civilian-led like operation it, yeah. as a mm. like a plot point. Once we get past that, we do have a cool thing where they actually come up with interesting creative plans to try and take down Godzilla. Like, that yeah. was surprising. That message that people plans. and their governments are different things, yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. Um, the the this begins a scene where you have uh, all of our boat crew going to a meeting, uh, a bunch of uh, citizens and civilians led by uh, ex. Uh, he's an ex destroyer captain. I forget the name of the destroyer, uh, but I almost want to say I noticed. I think the destroyer that he was the commander of makes an appearance later in the film as one of the ships, but I, I can't remember. But mm. I think Captain Hot is his name. Uh, Captain Hata is uh, sort of leading this effort to try and kill Godzilla because the militaries can't get involved, apparently. So they come up with a plan. Uh, He gets all these people together. They got all these scientists, some people who lead some companies. And Doc explains the plan to everyone because Doc was, you know, he developed naval weapons during the war. He's a smart man, you could tell because of his glasses. Um, And he says, all right, here's our plan. Our plan is to wrap all these cords around Godzilla and then use bubbles to make him sink down to the bottom of this trench. Um, And the pressure will probably kill him. And if that doesn't work, we're then going to initiate plan B, which is to have all of these balloons uh, go off around Godzilla, which will rise him back to the surface. And that pressure change will, uh, will, will, will hopefully kill him. The Which I think is very creative and interesting. Rion gas, yes. specifically, right? Yes, yeah, yeah that's right. Gas um, the idea of using the environment itself to destroy Godzilla is an interesting idea. Yeah, yeah. it's it's not just we're gonna we're gonna make a big gun and then we're gonna shoot the big gun at Godzilla. It's definitely because the plus these are civilians; they don't have access to military equipment, especially after the war. Um, yeah, so I mean they, make this they have to because use... the the ships they have they have been demilitarized already. They have no guns on them anymore. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. right. Um, so they don't have like big cannons, destroyers with guns, anything like that. So they're using the power of science and ingenuity oh, yeah, to yeah. try and kill Godzilla. I really like the plan. I think it's super neat. Um, it's it's just sort of inventive and interesting. Well, what I liked was that as they were explaining it, I was sort of listening to that and going, I mean, that's probably worth trying yeah. um, compared to d- having already shown that like shooting at it doesn't seem to be a particularly effective idea. Yeah. Um, if I was in that room and they presented that to me, it'd be like, well, I mean, that seems to me like a better alternative than doing nothing. So yeah. I understand the thinking. I understand the notion that, if, yeah, sure, this is a giant dinosaur um, that seems to be very difficult to stop. But surely yeah. 
they now plan to leverage essentially water pressure the 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 like the the world itself against him that's that's probably the best shot we got doesn't he describe yeah. it as uh we're gonna kill it with the power of the sea the sea yes yeah, it's, like it's that, just yeah. kind of a cool moment of like humans and earth working together to kill godzilla yep. yeah it's cool as a, you know as a, again as the difference where it's like ah no see godzilla he's in charge of earth he's the He's the one who determines the world order. Big lizard there fighting, fighting the, the bad. Uh, what's the one? Ghidorah, the the one with the three heads. King Ghidorah. Ghidorah, yeah. yeah. And so uh, yeah. they 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 have this plan that they've hatched up, and they need people to actually do it because it takes people to you know do all this stuff to man the man the ships and fly them around and drive them and all that stuff. Um, can't rely on the Japanese government or the U.S. government or the Soviets or anything to get help. They have to do it themselves. This has to be us. We've, you know, the future of the country is in our hands, that kind of thing. And Hata is making this appeal that he wants people to know that this is dangerous. They can't guarantee it'll work, but he's asking them to help. And he doesn't blame them if they don't want to because, you know, he's a veteran himself. He knows a lot of the, you know, all these people in front of him. You know, the, the war was only a few years back. Oh, we were, yep. you know? Yeah, you've, he you've been asked them. to do a lot. You've been asked to do a lot, and now you're being asked to do a lot again. Um, so and a few people leave. A few people, yeah, a few people leave. leave. Uh, Which I much prefer. At, uh, yes. As the, as, like normally, the cliche is, "Oh, and one guy does like a rally and cry, and then everybody's like, yeah, I like it way more." Oh, than yeah, he people. says. I think the cliche um, is that um, he says, that, he, or they all leave, or all leave up, except like one except person. The main guys. Obviously. Yeah, yeah. He's there's one guy something like he's like, are are you sure that we're it does like is this going to be certain death? And Hada says like, uh, uh, maybe I I don't know I can't I can't promise it to you. And he's like, well, it's better than wartime. And yeah, everyone's was... like, ah, oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, and they they all get to you know, yeah. and they all do it. So uh, there's you know, everyone bands together and they're they're doing their part. So I really like that. And yeah. afterwards that night, uh, our boat crew. Uh, Kid Doc, Captain, and Koichi are together, and they're having a bit of a dinner, sort of discussing the plan a little bit. Captain's a bit spec uh, spectacle, skeptical of things, <laughs> and he says that the way that they're going to lure Godzilla over the trench to drop it is they've got this big, um, like, underwater speaker that's going to play Godzilla noises so that it will mm. think that there's a competitor to its territory. Uh, so that it will go and fight him, and that's how they're going to kind of lure him into place. But Captain, he's got, you know, he's got Koichi. He's like, you fool, you know, she's gone now. Why didn't you marry her? And Koichi says, because he wasn't mentally ready. To, he wasn't, like, he had his own demons to fight, and I think he wanted to take care of that before he got involved with somebody else. Um, the read I took was he, he was too, like, emotionally and mentally not there. Um... To, Which, um, to kind of to, to make that step with her and make her like officially a part of his life in that element. Um, what's interesting is that obviously it's kind of leading to the point that by the end of the film he'll be in that place. Which is, you know, that's cool. Uh, in terms of like constructing a narrative, right? That's the way you do it. Find, you know, by the end of the film he resolves it. But I, the idea I find interesting would be like, what if part of it is that he could have done it anyway, as part of his attempts to like move forward? That it, it that mm. for as much as uh destroying Godzilla is obviously incredibly important symbolically for demonstrating his growth and having moved past it and and ready to move on with his life, that he still could have like made those kinds of efforts beforehand anyway. Yeah, but part of the I reason think he's so upset about himself and goes so self destructive is because he knows that he could have done that. You know, he could have actually, you know, married her and tried to move on with his life more so than existing in this state of limbo where he's kind of moving on but kind of stuck in the past. Yeah, I think he says my war isn't over yet, so mm -hmm. uh, he was just too hesitant. Uh, like, a part of him wanted to, but, but he just he wasn't mentally ready it. yet. Yeah. Yep. It's partly uh, because he's, it's like it's almost as if he has the belief that he doesn't it's like he doesn't deserve to live. He doesn't deserve to have a life. Yeah, like until I he's atoned, he's, uh, he's not exactly. worried about it. Yeah. And that now that she's died, he's starting to get on the path of my only redemption is death. Um, that's the only path to redemption that I have is, mm. is where he's starting to be moving towards uh, 
in the second act. He says that to, you know, Captain, and, you know, he, he's clearly not in a good place, and he really wants to fucking kill Godzilla. Uh, yeah. He really, <laughs> yeah. he's, he really wants this big thing dead. Because he asks and... for a plane, if he can get a hold on a, a, of a plane that he could fly. Mm. Mm-hmm. And anger yes. Godzilla. That's right. Yeah. So his job, he he asks if there's a plane, and they don't have access to you know like aircraft like a fighter because you know it's post war Japan. You're not allowed to have really a military, so uh, they don't really have access to a a, a war plane or a fighter plane. Um, they find one that's in rough shape. It's like a prototype that was used to shoot down bombers, and it's in this old hang. So it's, it's basically in a wooden shed. They only had a few prototypes of them. They're kept here in the mainland, thinking that they might get used for a like a, a war that never ended up getting this far into the you know mm. Japanese mainland. Um, but it's not in a state to fly yet. It's not airworthy. So he they need needs. A mechanic. They need a mechanic. We need a top mechanic to fix this plane. Oh, he knows sure one. Go. He does know one. That's right. He does. Uh, the uh, the mechanic from the very beginning. Uh, Tachibana, the guy who blamed him for, you know, all of his men dying because he didn't shoot the guns on the fighter. So uh, he needs the plane to sort of distract Godzilla and sort of help bring it in, um, if that's the case. But he has some other thoughts. That I think that's what he tells them, but what he's really going to use it for will become apparent. Yes. Um, mm-hmm. But he needs, but, but no, none of that's going to happen if the plane can't fly. So he, he goes on this quest to find Tachibana, who so sort of disappeared after himself, the war. Yeah, deliberately made himself hard to find. Um, yes. And to bring him out into the open, he does that by deliberately antagonizing him. Which yeah, is kind a of a clever little twist. Yeah, yeah, he sends a bunch of letters saying that it's Tachibana's fault that all those yeah. men on the island died. And that, pitches, that pisses Tachibana off. And he goes yeah. and he finds Koichi. Likely and... because had he had sent all those messages out saying, please, I'd like your help, he would never have come. Yeah, yes. exactly. He was like, I'm, I'm going to help you. Fuck it off. It reminds me of how um, a lot of people have said conventional wisdom says you should ask for help online and you'll get it. It's like, no, you should present your answer as correct when you know it's wrong and you will get <laughs> the correct answer <laughs> yeah. in response. It's unreal. If you're like, which cable do I need to do this? Just make a post, say, no, fucking amazing the workaround to just use this cable to do this thing. They'll be like, no, it's not. You have to use it. And then they will source everything, explain <laughs> everything just because they're like, I am so right. You're so wrong. And you're just they're like, Thank you. <laughs> there we go. And that's kind of what he does. He does, that's right. Um, and when Koichi is heading home one night, Tachibana hits him in the back of the head, ties him up, and says, you fucker, you, you jerk, asshole. you asshole, uh, uh, how could you possibly say these things? And Koichi says, well, I just said those things because I knew it's the only way to get you to come. I need your help. I'm putting together a team. Um... I, I need you to help fix this plane so that we can save, you know, Japan, so that we can, you know, destroy Godzilla. We, we've got this guy, we've got a plan going on, but I need your help. And he convinces, uh, convinces him to help. Uh, though not without trying, he has to really beg and he has to really say that, you know, I know I, I, I really need this. I, I've got to do this. This is something that I, I have to do. I can't let, you know, Godzilla destroy everything. Tachibana, I forget what he says specifically to him that changes his mind. He, but, but he says, like, I, I've lost everyone. And I think he mentions that it's vulnerable from the inside. So he has, like, some information to work with. But he says it's vulnerable from the inside. I need a plane. Do you, do you understand what I'm getting here? And Tachibana's like, all right, let's do it. Right. So they start repairing the plane. Tachibana comes in to look at the, I forget what it's called, like the local fighter Shinden, I think it's called. Uh, uh, something like that, yeah. Yeah, it, local fighter Shinden, I think is what it is. But the Shinden is the is the experimental plane that he's going to be flying. Mm. And uh, Tachibana is set to fix it up, along with some modifications, as we'll find out. I'm putting together a team. That's right, he is. And what a team it is. All of the civilians, all of our protagonists, they're getting the destroyers together, they're loading up supplies, they're prepping the cords and cables and all their science bubbles and their big buoys. They're getting everything ready because Godzilla's coming. We gotta hurry. We don't know when he's gonna be back. So they're all at the destroyer, they're loading everything up and getting ready to do the plan. And, oh no, the buoys that have that are the buoys that are outside of... Japan that are set to detect radiation, 
they are they, they can see Godzilla coming. They start going off and they they try to blow up some mines, but that doesn't stop him. There's nothing they could do. Godzilla's on his way, um, and he arrives way sooner than they expect. They thought they'd have more time to get this trap ready, but they just they just can't quite do it. Godzilla starts to head in uh, to the mainland to start attacking things. Godzilla's coming in. They may only have like a, a day or two left. They're prepping. Um, they got other destroyer stuff, getting it ready together. And when the buoys start, you know, going off and saying he's he's coming, he's coming. Uh, Doc gets all the papers together and says, "All right." And he does this little triangulation, whatever, with the papers and the you know those little slide rules and whatnot. And he says, "All right, we we think he'll be here any time. He's coming this way." And he has this speech that he sort of tells to everybody in their intelligence office. All of the technicians want to personally go on the destroyers to make sure all of the equipment goes off smoothly and perfectly, even though it'll put them in danger. He gives this inspiring speech, Doc does. He says, uh, this is the part where he talks about how the Japanese government treated lives way too cheaply. It would, it, it would give them faulty equipment, planes that didn't have ejection seats, tanks that didn't have thick, uh, thick enough armor, uh, it would tell people to, you know, drive planes into buildings as kamikaze pilots. Their lives were treated too cheaply by the Japanese government. So he wants everyone to, you know, make sure that what they're doing is what they really want to do. But we're going to do it. This is a citizen-led effort. You know, we can do this on our own. You know, everyone's kind of like, yeah, this is our last little hurrah before they get their, you know, night of sleep before the mission gets carried out. Um, Which is um, really cool to have a story where... You have a bunch of characters that are essentially committing onto a very a, a very dangerous path, and yet the characters want to make sure that they treat their lives and the lives of everybody who's agreeing to do this with some amount of reverence and respect. Um, that ultimately the goal isn't for all of us here, you know, to die, right? The goal is to win and to live, because that's what it's all about. It's uh, preserving life, um, and if necessary, sacrificing themselves to preserve life, but hopefully getting out of this alive themselves so that they can go back to their lives and lead their lives. It's nice to have um, that amount of reverence for human life in a, when, when it feels like a lot of the time it can get way more in the realm of like, yeah, we're all going to fucking die in a blaze of glory. Fuck yeah. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, I mean, let's, let's try and, let's all try and, you know, get out of this alive so that we can return to our families and to our lives that we want to live. I like mm -hmm. it. It's, good. it's, it's a very nice good scene. Positive. Very positive. But a few, ha a few things happened that night. A few things happened mm -hmm. that night. The, the day before the big operation, as they're leaving the intelligence office and, you know, the HQ after Doc's speech and everything, Kid, who's with them, and his arm's in a sling. You know, he hurt his arm during the, uh, the Godzilla attack at the Takao. He, he, you know, he's like, woo, I, you know, I'm finally ready. You know, it's finally going to happen. We're finally going to do this. I can't wait. And then Captain and Doc, who are walking in front of him, they say, no, you're not, uh, you're not coming with us. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, you, you're one arm down, so you're you're kind of useless. And he's wondering, is is it because I'm? Are you not letting me come? He goes, Shigashima, you know, uh, uh, Koichi, he's he's coming. They're like, why can't I go? Is it because I wasn't in the war? Because I, I I'm not a veteran. And they say no. Like not having been to war is something to be proud of. You know, be glad yeah. that you didn't have to do that. Essentially, um, getting getting those AMR vibes. Uh, kind of yeah, that's that's cool, right? Of um of emphasizing the idea of take solace in the fact that you don't know what it's like, you know. Yeah, hold on to that, like grab onto that with two hands and and hold it dear. Yeah. Um, and then as they're walking away, he's screaming at them. Yeah, he's you know, begging him. He's like, fight. yeah, it's like I want to yeah, defend. I want to defend my country. Well. I want to, you know, I want to do my part. I want to do my duty. I want to. I want to help you. Take me with you. But they just, uh, yeah. you know, Doc and, and, and the captain, they walk away. Yeah. Presenting it as, its motives are, are quite pure. They're, they're not like these self-serving, look at how awesome and great I am. I want to create like a legacy for myself. It is very much the pure sort of, I want to help. Because um, um, as, that's right, because as uh, Doc and Captain are walking away, from him as he's you know begging in the background to take him with him, I think Captain says essentially that the, we're leaving you the future. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, you got to be alive because one of my you're favorite the lines from the whole film in terms of encapsulating the nature of sacrifice, the reason we sacrifice. Uh, it was, yes, it was uh, very similar to "Don't waste." Uh, oh wait, earn this. Uh, and uh, Saving Private Ryan, you know, the same kind of uh, the same kind of idea. They, that, there's uh, such a strong sense of nobility when you know it's like yeah, but like like the the, the 
they get a really strong sense of motivation when they know it's what we're doing is providing the next generation a better life than we had. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which is much different from the end of the war, where everybody's just throwing away their lives. Well, it's, it's much know, different than a government telling you to go old. die for something that's really not going to make a difference. So, yeah. this, well, however, will make the... all of the difference. Exactly, yeah. Um, yeah, the, I, I love this idea of, you know, because Doc and Captain, they're, they're older, you know, they're older guys. Um, he's clearly, I mean, the fact they call him Kid, and he doesn't, they said he doesn't, he's not really fond of that name. Uh, but this idea of, yeah, we're doing this for you. We're doing it for your generation. You need to be here to, you know, make sure things go on after we're gone, you know, if things go south. The next scene, we have uh, Koichi checking out the plane. He's doing his look over everything on the plane, uh, everything that's going to happen, everything that's going to be, you know, going on. And I believe this is where we learn about what really was what the plan actually is yeah what the uh, plan what essentially the really is and it was at this point as they were explaining the plan that i was thinking ah i see where you're going movie mm -hmm. um, so we've got um what he has done is koichi told tachibana and his mechanic buddies that he wants to remove like the gun and a bunch of ammunition from the plane so that in its place, there are some big old bombs that can be put in. Big yeah. old, big old bombs. Uh, so, I think you can see where this is going. Uh, it's pretty clear that now his intention is to fly this thing into Godzilla's mouth and, and blow, blow it up. up. Yeah, yep. he's going to sacrifice himself. himself of his uh, of his sins. But that is his belief. Mm -hmm. And when you see that, it's, it's just I was sitting there and it's like ah, I think I. Uh, I think I see where you're heading, movie, as your uh, your resolution here, and I really like the angle that you're going down here. If you end up going that way, for me it was a little bit later. It wasn't here yet, but uh, yeah, I got through that. I think for me it was it was because um, I I understand why because it's kind of like um, the conversations with the mechanic kind of reinforce the idea of yeah you ha you should do this you fucker mm. you you ran off you didn't do what you were supposed to do yeah maybe this is what you should do the fact that the mechanic is so cynical. Yeah. And a lot of his interactions can lead in the direction of maybe we are just doing exactly what, you know, his plan is, which is he's going to do this and then, you know, like load his plan up with bombs and then fly it into Godzilla's mouth and blow himself, um, blow himself up. And it's like, OK, there you go. And that's that's his story full circle. But it's just looking at that and with all of the things that have been said by all of the other characters in the film, you're just like. I feel like you're a bit more uh, life affirming um, film. So I'm curious. What mm. I, like how it's all gonna play out. It's funny for you as you say that. Um, I was like, kind of on the the for the, the position of like, I appreciate the uh, the value of um, knocking out. Sorry, I forget her name. Um, Noriko. Yeah, the what Bizarre. you can draw from it in terms of a journey. But I was like, I feel like that's at odds with like leave. Uh, if we're gonna have our main guy die, which by the way. Maybe I can explain now. When I was listening to people describe the story for this, and they tried to do spoiler-free, they were still saying... The way they would describe the final scene is basically that, like, he turns up, he's got the ship, everything's set, and, you know, oh, what an amazing scene. So I was just sitting there like, ah, oh, so, okay, he does actually go through with the kamikaze. Interesting. Like, that, from, you know, without seeing the film. And so I was like, at this point, like, it's kind of weird that we're going to have her die, and then we're going to have him die, Leaving the child like without the exactly. paternal mm -hmm. figures when the film's point is more so about like the saving of life. So I could have accepted him dying to save those two. I was like knocking both of them out. Really, it's so uh, funny, isn't it? Considering how I everything think it's turns interesting. out. Yeah, considering how things do turn out, and we can certainly talk about that when we get there, as I'm sure we will. But I think that you could have done a number of things that were thematically appropriate here because a lot of it is based off of the situation and how people contextualize what they're doing. If it was if it was Sumiko, for instance, who got Akiko uh, to basically become her mother um, figure fully, that would have been something. And then the parents die, one tragically, one, you know, I guess, I guess they both would have died, you know, heroically in that sense. One to save the other and the other to save essentially everyone. Mm -hmm. um, I think it, it, it's kind of open ended in that there's not one thing that could have happened that kind of would have worked. You can definitely um, argue that that's still appropriate that they both would have died to create a better world. That's what I, that, yeah. I agree. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. 
I think the read was essentially, is this going to be a very melancholy, kind of like bittersweet of, yes, he died, but he saved what he loved kind of ending? Or is it going to be more... Rose than that? <laughs> <laughs> he rose T-code. He rose T-code. It's just, that was... Uh, Saving what we was, love, yeah. Because I, I, I definitely felt that it was going to end the way that it did end. But there was a part of me that was wondering, but you could go the other way as well. That's you right. Could. Um, it's well constructed enough that you could take it in either direction, um, and and that it would still work. But yes, at this point, it was like that was particularly interesting because I got the impression it's like that would be what he was going to ask him to do. Was it he was going to? It's you know, it just it's just storytelling rhyming. You know, uh, he was see. a kamikaze pilot who couldn't go through with it. That now he's going to be piloting this plane. Maybe he's gonna. Maybe he's gonna give it another try. You know. Maybe he's gonna give it another shot. So uh, this night, uh, right before the big event, we have uh, Koichi sharing sort of one last night with Akiko, as far as he can. He's concerned. Um, it's very sad. She, you know, Akiko's really worried. She, where's mom? You know, like I, I want to see her again, and I miss her. And he's like, yeah, I know, but I'm, I'm not gonna leave you though. And you know, she calls her, you know, is your daddy and that kind of thing. It is very, you know. It's like, it's, it's uh, you know, they have that father-daughter kind of thing going on. Um, he gets this envelope, and he puts it next to the sleeping Akiko, mm. and he heads off to the plane uh, that night, and then we have him, you know, with the bombs and everything. But you see, what's interesting about the scene where we have Koichi at the, the Shinden, the, the fighter where it's got all the bombs and everything on it, um... Him, remember him and Tachibana. They have a they have a history, you know, from Odo Island, and he is uh, Koichi is pretty much telling him that it is my intention to essentially sacrifice myself to fly this into Godzilla's mouth and kill it and stop it. Tachibana, you know, Ko Koichi's in the pilot seat, and Tachibana's running through all the stuff. You know, here here's this red lever. Pull this to arm the bombs before you hit. Um. And Koichi's like, yep, I'm doing it, I'm ready. Mm -hmm. And then Koichi has brought with him all the photographs of all the mechanics on the island who died from Godzilla. Um, and he's got his, uh, the drawing, a drawing that Akiko made of him, uh, Nariko, and her. Um, and it is here that I think Tachibana sees that Koichi really is truly committed to doing this. That he really has things to save, things to do this for. That he, he's fully committed to doing this. And that is what, you know, kind of sort of repairs their relationship, essentially. Um, and then before it, uh, you know, the, he's shown him the plane and how it works before the, you know, the takeoff later. And he's, uh, you know, as, as the camera pans out, he's shown him some more stuff in the back of the cockpit. So who knows mm -hmm. what that would be. I think uh, he even says, like, oh, it also does one more thing. Yeah, one more thing, and then he... He made him, like, a little sandwich, and he put it in his lunchbox. So. Yeah, that was one more thing. There you go. That was very nice. Mm -hmm. I like a yeah. pre-Godzilla fight lunchbox. Um, yeah. Don't want to fight big lizard with an empty stomach. So, evening passes, and the next morning, Akiko wakes up, and she, she brings this envelope over to Sumiko, who's basically... I think they even call her an aunt at that point, because of their re close relationship. Uh, mm -hmm. She brings this, um, brings an envelope to Sumiko, and this envelope is full of money in what looks like to be some sort of a, like a government check or something like that. It's, it's a whole bunch of money. It's full of money for, you know, Akiko. There's a note along with it that says, use this money for her. And I think that's Sumiko being like, oh shit, he's going to go and, you know, he intends to die on this mission to kill Godzilla. So... There we go. Those two are together now. The buoys detect the Godzilla. Godzilla's getting closer. And before the destroyers can actually leave the harbor to go and get into position, Godzilla is already there. He's showing up. He's faster than they thought he'd be. He gets close to the mainland and he starts moving in. And they say, no, you know, we, we've got to we've got to take off. We got to do the plan. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, uh, Koichi in the Shinden fighter, he can distract Godzilla um, and lure it out into the ocean over the trench. Uh, so we get a scene of Godzilla going through the countryside. He stomps, stomping, uh, trampling on farms, and Koichi goes to it, and he's, you know, he's flying around. He shoots it a bit with some of his, some of his guns that he's got uh, to, to lure it away. 
and with that, I need to use the loo. So <laughs> one of y'all can can pick up. I'll be right back. Sorry. Godzilla's definitely I like, what pee? the fuck? Uh, he's like, I just want to, I just want to do my rampaging, but this is like this fly yeah. that keeps buzzing fly. around, spitting on me. Mm -hmm. like, what are you doing? Like, so yeah. um, you know, it, it can be awkward as a big lizard to to have that kind of shit get in your way. But mm -hmm. um, I was thinking this could be where you could incorporate the um, those two people I was talking about the the elements of the different countries. If it was their job to lure Godzilla, because it gives you then people for Godzilla to hit down or to you know attack, so that it feels like a full action scene. Um, because he has to fly very very close a couple of times to. Yeah, he flies real mm -hmm. close. And I was thinking, imagine like a ragtag group of a bunch of different nationalities all, you know, communicating and trying to lure Godzilla and some of them going down during this. I just think it would make for a really awesome and uh, representative battle of what the film is trying to put across. Mm. Even though the set piece itself is still pretty cool. Absolutely. Uh, even with the one, even just with the one plane flying around. Um, and I guess you get the because you the the ship that gets thrown onto land when Godzilla uh, shows oh, yeah. up early. The ships that were meant to be like the lure, so you already get a bit of your uh, destruction there <laughs> mm. <laughs> that you're looking that everybody's looking for in a Godzilla movie. And what's the nature of this? They have four. Is it four battleships and two of them? Oh, yeah, it... four. Yeah. I think it was the two of them were meant to lure it to a specific location, and then and then from there, the other two would like use the tethers and stuff to surround it. Was there anybody the, on uh... the two that get nuked? Oh no. yeah. yeah, yeah, I think so. Right? Well, this, no, this I'm, pretty, I'm pretty sure the ones that get nuked, they they they're like tied together. Uh, with, oh, the, with the steering wheel. Yeah, because this was I, like I do remember something like that. A bit of a contention. I was trying to remember this right on Real BBC. I couldn't. I couldn't. Remember if it was uh, a lot of lost life or partial lost life or no lost life. Mm -hmm. I wasn't sure. I thought it was. Yeah, no. I thought I'm... it was partial. I thought some people died because of that. Because I, 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 I remember I the two remember ships that were tied together. Those were the ones that they were piloting. Because I do remember the they show us that they, they show the bridge and there's no one in there. Oh, and then huh. they get nuked. So I right, think okay. there's two of them that are empty. At least that's the implication. That's the impression I got. I, I could be wrong, but I okay. think those uh, were empty. When Godzilla gets the laser ready, uh, Doc even says "Attaboy," right? Like, like this is the mm. plan to lure out the actual laser first. Oh, oh, sorry. I we, we're getting we're getting mixed up. There was the ship that didn't have anybody piloting it. That was the distraction to get blown up. I was talking about the the ship that got thrown. Into oh, the pool. Oh, I was. Okay, so, I'm uh, also curious yeah. if there was anybody on that as well. I assume I think there, was. there was. Definitely, I think there was definitely people on that one, and that there was nobody on the decoy. The decoy was empty on purpose. Mm -hmm. They wanted okay. to put it out there, blow it up. Nobody dies, so that it gives them an opportunity to have Godzilla on cooldown, essentially. Yeah, which you know, the throne one yeah. definitely had people on there. there was yeah, because the, the throne yeah. one was them like thinking, "Oh shit, are we doomed?" And then and then they're like, "Well, no, let's still we're still mm -hmm. going to go ahead with the mission." <laughs> Yeah, and there's a cool element of Doc being like, because even sh they show Godzilla's face is all fucked up from the the laser again in that moment. Mm -hmm. So it's like he's got to recharge. We're free from the laser for now, which yeah, gives you the nice. Uh, it's it, like I said, I almost describe it as a reverse ticking clock. What I guess I mean is it gives you a refresh rate that's super important because otherwise we wouldn't be able to buy this as possible because Godzilla would just zap yeah. everybody. A refresh rate that would then turn into a new ticking clock. Yeah. Have a good little pee there, Rex. I did. I had a little minus one, if you will. Mm, so. Nice. Oh my yeah. god. Oh my goodness. Um, where, where, was, where are you guys at? I guess he's he's uh, the laser about to fire was just laser, fired. Or? Oh, with the decoys. Just fired the laser, the decoy. Yeah. Yeah. So somewhere before that, uh, the uh, lady auntie gets a telegram as well from someone. But we That's don't true. know from who from who yet, but uh, yeah, Sumiko Santa gets a Claus. telegram. He's, oh, Santa Christ! No, I didn't no. get that. No. <laughs> By the way, that's just a thing. It's it's one of those other little things about having it in this setting because we're just probably never gonna have that again. A guy in a little outfit delivering telegram messages or telegraph messages yeah. or telegram messages. I guess it would be I, gram. Yeah, I think telegram, telegram messages. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's like one of those neat little things from the period that you know, I, I like to see. Good flavor, good outfits on his on his bike. Look at him go. Um, so uh, who knows what that could be? I guess we'll find out later. And also, I really did like the whole uh, the the decoy ship thing because 
there was a part of you that wonders, like, what if it just uses its heat ray? You know, how do you account for that? And he's like, well, we got some decoys set up that it'll target. It's like, oh, okay, it's good. Yeah, it's fair enough. The one thing that maybe doesn't quite line up perfectly is that they panic when they see that, and then the doc explains it. And it's like, wouldn't you have told them this was the plan? Isn't that oh, the, yeah, the whole point of the plan? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I would have told them ahead of time. Because they're like, oh my god, the heat ray, it'll destroy us. And he's like, no, 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 it has to recharge, because now it's been used on the on those two ships, which was his plan. That's why they had the decoy ships, right? Just exactly. making sure I get it. Yeah, yeah. that's the whole plan. It was like that's um, way more. It's for us. Yeah, yeah. that scene. So uh, I guess we're at the point where they they let go of their little. They got each of the ship has a line, and they're gonna basically wrap these lines around Godzilla. And on these lines are the buoy slash um, the the bubbles of fleur fluoron or what was it? Um, Freon. Freon gas. That's the Freon thing. gas. Freon, and yeah, the Freon <laughs> gas, and the, the these are the science things that will make it. Yeah, there's yeah. two things about this. Thing. One, um, if Godzilla, Godzilla doesn't do a lot of moving in this part. He's uh, he's mostly just chilling out, watching them do well, their he's thing. Mostly distracted by the plane. He's flying around with his plane. He's not really. Um, I, I, I I struggle to buy that. I, uh, he's not really doing anything. He's sort of just. Well, the thing there. is that Godzilla is clearly not stupid. He's all like yeah. dumb. Like, hmm. You know, he has some sense of, hmm, we should probably deal with that first or that now, you know. Rather and like, than it, just you can't like, argue to me that like yeah. Godzilla's dealing with the airplane when, when it's just like, he's mainly just looking at it. Like, it's. <laughs> and then occasionally when it comes by, he'll try and munch at it. Like, I would have liked, I think, uh, it, and I think it would be higher stakes too. I was saying this earlier. If we had more uh, pilots and the, our guy is the last one because yeah. he's the best, that would be something. Mm -hmm. But that the, in order to keep Godzilla still, they have to get close to him to give him a chance to swipe at them to they keep him in place. Yeah. You keep him busy. And you know, we, we do lose a couple of people from that because it's just that's that's the job. Or, or if you want to make it so nobody gets hit by him, that's totally fine too. Hey, uh, power uh, yeah, 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 yeah. That'd be a way to do it. Because I, I do like the nature of trying to make it so no one dies in this big fight, even though they all expected to, sort of. Mm. Yeah. It's yeah, it's cool. It's, it's accepting it as a possibility, but working to you know live because people generally want to live. Right. Yep, and the film advocates for that. Uh, of it hey, does. you know, doing heroic things is cool, but try to make it out in one piece if you can. And then the other thing was just. Maybe I'm not understanding this, but how did they fuck it up so that they actually smashed into each other, the two ships? Yeah, I found that weird, uh, too. No, I think it wasn't it that they just, that I was something that they had to do. I they think it's intentional to, to make sure that there's, there's like, as little distance between the lines yeah, as possible. I think so. Was that uh, it? Like, like they couldn't pass I otherwise? Because so the doc, I think the doc even says something along the lines of, you know, it, it's all right. You know, the ships can take the the, the ships can take it. Just everyone hold and on. We have to do it. Yeah. The, the implication yeah. from what you said was we have to do it this way. So hold on. Is it like the cranes be wouldn't be able to pass over the ships otherwise? Like the wires? Uh, I think it was just that they had to be as oh, that's, that literally might be it. Yeah. Uh, that might but be it, it's. Yeah. But the, the thing. I've not seen it twice. The, plan, Tw the second time for any film is where I pick up all the smaller things. Yeah, yeah I it, it was it was part of the plan. They knew it was going to happen. You know, Hada knew about it and Doc knew about it, and they just said, "You know, basically brace for it. The ships can handle it." Uh, and then once it's done, they even say like the transfer is complete or the passage is complete, mm -hmm. full speed ahead. So it was yeah, it was part of the plan for them to do that. Alrighty then. Um, but they do. Uh, the the ships kind of scrape together as they you know make their crossing, and then they get their lines around him, and then they, waits until it's uh, taut before activating the freon, which yes, is risky. They make sure obviously, the laser's coming. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you get the you get the scientists at the at the nice analog depth meter with all the numbers scrolling by. Yeah. So all the yeah. little technology details. It just it's really cool to see this old analog stuff being used against you know this big creature, you know, all that human Well, I also like really the, it. when it's activated, you do get that shot of Godzilla, like, being like, Wah! <laughs> like, what, <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck did what you humans fuck? do to me? You must um, like but yeah, they do it. They wait until the, the ropes are taut, they hit the, uh, the Freon gas bubbles, and Godzilla starts to sink. And yep. it gets deeper and deeper, and he's going down. <laughs> he's really, really surprised, as anyone would be, probably in that situation. And they have that yeah, shot where um, uh, he lands, so to speak, and the tail turns gets, off. And it just gave me a sense of, like, what the fuck? Like, mm -hmm. what, what and, just uh, happened to me? They have that great scene where he's he's going deep down into the water, and then he sort of implodes a little bit. Mm -hmm. 
I thought was like, oh, that's really that's really neat to show that. Um, so let me see. They and then like as he, I think that because I hold him down there, and then when they start to raise him up, it starts working. But then Godzilla starts fighting back. You know, well, he get right cuts through the work. um. Yeah, he cuts through the cord. Yeah, he cuts yeah, through the uh, cords. Balloons. So their line is still like tethered on him, but he's cut the the things off of him. He's That's something I was going to ask them. about as well. Is how does that work exactly? Because he gets rid of the ring of um. Uh, floats. Maybe he tore the things off the ring, uh, or he he to he tore the things off the line, um, but not the line itself, because the buoys go off and then they rise to the surface. So I guess he so, tore those off, and it, it's interesting and it too because part of the ring itself. I think we both described it was he would have torn because that's the reasonable thing. But the character says uh, he chewed through it, and I was like, chewed through it. I don't think he chewed through those. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. I don't know if yeah, that was maybe. Yeah, I guess he just you know, is he, he grabbed them, he ripped them off. He, he yeah, I would have thought he would claw at them until off. they come off. I was just, uh, it was like so he detached from them, but not from the cable. Um, yeah, I think so. Uh, well, I guess he, he ripped them off of the cable. the cable because um, that was the problem that was happening with the ships. It was starting to pull on the cranes and destroy them. Yes, it was like and, a big uh, tug of war between them and Godzilla. And, they got to and as pull we them up. heard before from Doc saying it, because it was suggested by it was only it was Kid that had suggested we got the two destroyers. Why not just pull? Why not yeah. just pull him up with it? Why why not use the balloons? And Doc said, "Well, two destroyers can't pull, you know, Godzilla up. He's he's too heavy. Wow. We can't do it." More than two destroyers. Hmm. Oh. Could that but it turns out that uh yeah they're they're trying to they they try to pull him up with the balloons but he cut, he he gets the balloons off of him and they rise to the surface without him and they're like well we you know two destroyers can't pull him up but Hot is like well we got to try you know we we got to at least give it you know give it a try to get him as far up as possible so the pressure hopefully kills him the pressure change and so they start trying Godzilla's really heavy the destroyers are you know powerful but that it's it kind of like pulls the crane down a little bit, and they're having a lot of trouble trying to pull them up, and they just can't do it. And uh, that is when we have uh, we got our a little, uh, dumb rise of Skywalker. Of All right, the rise of Skywalker is <laughs> actually what came to mind. Yeah, oh, don't dare, don't uh, dare. Rise of Skywalker <laughs> did it don't first. Okay, we were the first ever uh. thing to do that. But yeah, a whole Ooh. bunch of little smaller boats being led by Yeah, a bunch of tugboats kid. and stuff have yeah. shown up, uh, including Kid at the front of it, who has, mm -hmm. uh, who has decided that even though he's told not to come up, he's going to show up with the uh, tugboats to help them out. Which mm -hmm. is really cool. Um, a a yeah, fun way neat. to incorporate him into the story. Uh, so they all, uh, in, a, in a way that is explicitly not shown... Uh, hook yeah, themselves yeah, up to the destroyers yeah. very quickly. <laughs> we we do a little <laughs> magic. It would it would take We're a bit there. of time. Yeah, uh, uh, I guess they're just really good at it. We'll go with that. The, <laughs> but that would take a while very... to get them all in position. Get all these Spider -Man lines on for the other ones. Out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All of all of the tugboats they separate into two groups, and each of those groups in attaches itself fashion. to a destroyer in a very orderly fashion. But you know, I that's just that. Uh, I, I just Japanese organization, you know, yeah. winning through the day. But well, I guess they, that would, would lead to the question: How long can Godzilla stay underwater for without drowning? Uh, I don't know. I, I guess the more relevant part would be: How long can he stay under there before you lose the value of the rapid uh, shift in pressure? It's that, uh, and, well, they show that. Yeah, they show us he's pretty fucked up when they get him to the surface. No, that's what, yeah. Well, that's what I'm saying is that that's the question, but we get the answer, which is evidently. I mean, it's still good. <laughs> like they still managed to, because I guess the thing is, is that you've already done the rapid down. Now mm -hmm. you're doing the rapid up, so it's still the same, the same thing in effect. Yeah, in the pressure but... change would kill anything. Uh, I, I guess except gods. Well, maybe if it had worked correctly, it, maybe it would have killed him if it worked correctly. You know, but but you know the the hitch in the plan of the buoys not going off properly only brings him up so high. It only brings them up about halfway, I think. Yeah, and then they got to bring them up the rest of the way. But what's cool is that even though things went wrong, they still dealt considerable damage to Godzilla. Oh yes. And even even when they eventually win, I mean, you got to come away from that believing. Well, that that effort was valuable. That that made a difference. Um, if they didn't manage to deal with that kind of damage, maybe it wouldn't have been so effective what eventually happens, which is just a good way of making it to where it kind of gets annoying in movies when, like, the protagonist makes the only difference 
And you can have a whole bunch of people working together and it doesn't do shit. And then, like, the hero is the only person who does it. But here it is a team effort through and through. Everybody contributed. Everybody was um, a meaningful factor in taking mm -hmm. down Godzilla. Because, yeah, they didn't get him, but they fucked him up quite a bit. Absolutely. A good plan. Um, well, they, they do their part. Everyone chips in. Everyone's helping. They're pulling and pulling. And they do bring Godzilla up to the surface. And uh, they show a bunch of, like, Godzilla's clearly hurt. He's got, like, it looks like Fuck ice crystals and, and shit and weird. Like, a lot of damage is happening to Godzilla. He's, he's really not having a good day. He's not enjoying this whatsoever. But it doesn't look like Godzilla's actually dead. But he's clearly wounded in some way. But he's yeah. not dead. Um, and unfortunately, uh, because he is not dead and only wounded, uh, he begins to charge up his heat ray once again. He's up at the top. They got him, you know, anchored. But, uh-oh, bad news. He's not dead yet. Mm -hmm. And the heat ray's coming, and everyone's like, oh, shit, he's going to totally blow us up. This sucks. Um, and it is a very somber moment. As, uh, they think, at least half of them think, they are going to die with from the heat ray. Their plan did not work. Um, but... At the last moment, as Godzilla is rearing up and he's ready to go and he's all turning glowing blue and he's got his mouth open and he's about to hit him, uh, that is when Shoichi uh, takes his plane and turns it around and he flies the plane right into Godzilla's mouth. A mm, little bit of time stretchy happens, but yeah. it's still pretty awesome. Because I, yeah. I love how they do it with like no music, you only do like the... Yeah, they it, it's it's a really uh cuz I guess the time stretchy it's on both sides. Ko Koichi knows what he's going to do. So I, on both sides they just lengthen it out for drama, but in I think in reality he would have he would have been there to do it. He was flying around the whole time. The main thing uh, I'm targeting is that Godzilla looks fully charged and they react to that fact. Then they spot him and he has to you know, travel what oh, looks like know. about a mile or so and like, Godzilla probably would have popped off the shot by then, but that's okay. But he's got to move things around. He's, hurt, he's hesitated, you know, it's, it's slowing down. But the pertinent, the pertinent reveal is that we flash back to the uh, conversation between Koichi and uh, engineer mechanic guy um, back when yes. he was explaining all of the functionality. And it's at this point, it's like, ah, yes, <laughs> we're doing it. Uh, of him telling him, uh, yeah, you pull this and, and you, can, uh, you can eject. Yep, it which, has an ejection uh, seat. Um, yeah, it's it, this was a little bit. Yeah, little this bit it's, it's cut quick. This. He does pull a uh, the eject right before crashing. Yeah, in. you can see it. Yes, there is a because... there's a few there's a few little details mm -hmm. that I like about this. Um, first off, when he was first being told about it, we didn't know exactly what he was referring to. The scene just kind of pans away from Koichi and Tachibana at the Shinden. Um, and Which to me was uh, that was what made me believe. Uh, yes, that I was a detail. Yeah. So, because yeah. in good movies, when they show you little bitty details and things like that to pick up on, it normally actually means something. So mm -hmm. they kind of dropped a hint of it later. But the flashback that we get uh, upon his ejection from the plane is that uh, Tachibana sees that Koichi really because Koichi commits to doing this before he knows there's an ejection seat. Right. He believes yeah, that he is yeah. going to die. It was the um, mechanic's idea to put in the ejector seat and then tell him about it. Yeah, um, um, which because Koichi's really... used to not having that. I mean, it was referenced by Doc that the you know there are no ejection seats on these you know, planes. planes were designed yeah. to not have ejector seats and to make it really difficult for you to open uh, the cabin the canopy, to get out. Yeah. Uh, sometimes they didn't have landing gear. They'd have the gear to get you up in the air, but no landing gear. There were a lot of ways that they were uh, designed. To yeah, uh, make it really trip. difficult yeah. to come back. Yeah, um, and it so was, I mean, case, if you're what... strapped for materials, then... I mean, the I think the Germans experimented with a similar idea and concept. Not a suicide um, uh, thing, but they, they experimented with a little tiny rocket plane that was literally disposable. You'd get a pilot in it, and he'd take off. It had no, like, landing gear. He only had just a little bit of fuel. Um, but he was... It, you're supposed to get up there fly around, shoot down a fighter or two if you're lucky, really lucky, and then eject um, so that you could land and then do that all over again. But for pretty obvious reasons, that never came to fruition, but even the Germans in the war were experimenting with the idea of disposable aircraft, though 
um, Germany's problem, particularly uh, in the uh, near the late or last years of the war, was they were literally running out of pilots. They just didn't have oh, well, trained pilots I mean, to actually fly stuff. So Germany and Japan had the same problem of no oil. Um, neither of them had. Yeah, very that. little oil. That's why that's the reason why Germany, the Caucasus, they wanted to get to the the oil fields. In Kiev. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, well, that's, you know, Stalingrad, right? The whole idea was to cut off the Caucasus so that they could get that, so that they could use the oil. And the reason why Japan attacked Pearl Harbor was stemming from the uh, oil embargo that uh, America put on Japan that cut, I think, I want to say, like, 90% of their oil supply. Um, yeah, neither of them... Uh, and then, of course, the longer the war went on, it's like, well, I mean, you're, you're, you're just plain running out of people. You're running out of people of military age. Uh, to participate in the war anymore. Yeah, and it takes it takes time, and they they even talk about it in the movie how uh, Koichi's actually trained to be a pilot. He uses that with the gun shooting the mines, and he uses it for you know flying the plane as well. But train actually training personnel to do these sorts of things takes, it takes time like, and it takes while. effort. Yeah, you know, yeah. you read and this books is... like autobiographies talking about uh, like American soldiers, and it's like what six, twelve months of uh, of training before they actually get deployed. So it'll be like, yeah. you might sign up in like 1943, but it's not until 44, 45 that you're actually getting deployed. Because if you send someone out there and they don't know, that's why, um, you know, as Germany was losing its pilots, the, the casualty rates for the Luftwaffe were just like, we're talking 90 plus percent. Because mm -hmm. you had all these trained, you know, American pilots who had seen action or who got, you know, those months and months and months of good training. And Germany just couldn't do that for their pilots. They had too few and they didn't have the time. So they were just getting absolutely smoked by the allies uh, plus, in the air of course was... again as was mentioned before the allies were able to replenish uh losses of equipment uh in ways that germany and japan could not do because they just didn't have the resources uh war, so a big part of war is logistics that's right you gotta have people and you gotta have stuff if you don't have people and stuff yeah. it's uh it doesn't look good what so... uh what's interesting about the payoff here because it, it really does feel appropriate that the mechanic the one who was the most critical, yeah, uh, blamed him of, for the deaths and chastised him for not doing his duty. That looking at Koichi, it's not like, okay, I understand that you want to do this now, and that's really good. But you don't have to kill yourself here for yeah. this. You don't have to die. That's not what I want. I don't want you to die. That's the same that's reason you have to sacrifice you yourself is the reason why you should live. Yeah, exactly. It's uh, and and so then that's what he tells him. Is, you know, live, and it's like, oh damn, full circle theme. You pulled it together, like wound tight in a nice bow. Like that's some good shit. <laughs> is what that is. That's some good life affirming, uh, positive storytelling there. And also, you get the um when you get the radio uh, broadcast from the destroyer of you know the pilot is ejected safely. You have you know Tachibana and the mechanics back at the 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 hangar essentially who are like elated to know that he actually did yeah. survive and that he made it exactly um, it, it's just like a really cool because because what the the story looks like is that after godzilla rampages through the city and as far as he's aware has killed noriko that he has now his attitude is godzilla represents my failure i have to destroy it and the only way that i can do that the only way that i should is uh, by destroying myself in the process um, to then have the perhaps the 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 big the person who was the main reason why he felt that that was the case not because it was his fault or anything but just because of his reaction to what happened on the uh, on the island of saying this is your fault you fucked up and the fact that that would have then been paired with uh, him not following through on the kamikaze mission to have that man tell him I want you to live. Um, I want you to, I want you to, I don't, I don't want you to die. I want you to do your duty to be a hero. Um, but I want you to come back, uh, and lead your life because that's what it's all in service of. And then when you tie that in with all of the speeches given by Doc and whatnot, um, all of the sort of messaging through the film, it's like, damn, that's, uh, that's some tight thematic writing, you know, that's some good shit. Yeah, baby. Um, and he blows Godzilla up. Blows yeah, him he up. does. The, the plane just the plane just smashes into Godzilla's face, and then after yeah. a couple seconds, it blows up and takes off Godzilla's head. So, I do um, like uh, yeah. <clears throat> Godzilla looks almost completely like wah, and then just sort of crumbles away into like little little pieces with the little laser pieces yeah. poking out as well. 
Yeah. Which um, I gotta I, say, I didn't expect to... him to just crumble. To be honest, I thought he yeah, would just sink or something. Well, when he was like, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> so regarding the crumbling element, something that I think I like about this movie is that they just present Godzilla being able to do these things without trying to get deep into the science of it or trying to look into. He, you know, he could do this because of this, and this is why he could do that. The other thing, um, the origins of Godzilla, we don't know what they are. Um, apparently, he's just a local, a big local legend. That there is a there's a short sequence in this. I don't think we brought it up, but the bikini uh, bikini atoll test in 1947. Right. They they imply that it's sort of supercharged. Godzilla. Yeah, they have a little shot where his like his right, skin yeah. is getting completely blown off, but I assume it's irradiated it's, him and it's a little it's subtle um i can believe yeah, I why some people might not know why he's small at the beginning and bigger at the end but they did they did sort of you know they hinted at what happened there so oh, and um, it hence contributes to the the what we talked about before which is maybe koichi could have killed him maybe yeah. maybe, back then, maybe yeah before he was uh radioactively charged and and all that but, maybe. Uh, they got him. which um i gotta say compared to I think it is really, really, really hard, especially when you present a big movie monster as being impervious to conventional, like, weapons, to present uh, the defeat of that entity in any way that isn't, like, eyebrow-raising. But in this case, of them flying it into his mouth and blowing it up, especially after what was shown before, uh, and maybe just aided by the fact that I like the characters, felt like one of the few times in one of these types of films where I looked at that and went, yeah, good job, guys. You deserve yeah, that. I, um, you are, I could you you know, yeah. you beat him. <laughs> you beat I mean, him you know, blowing player. up the head of the creature is typically, you know, it's generally going to be the way to go. Well, the, you know. in King of the Monsters, they blew up a nuke on Godzilla, and then he was a nuke walking and around, and he melted King Ghidorah. He melted, That's right, he melted and, Boston. And he melted all of the city and all the innocent people. It happens. Uh, it's fine. That's an honest mistake, okay? They yeah. were they were Bostonians. <laughs> it's fine. Um, so we, we, we get our, like, oh my gosh, he was able to eject safely. Everyone's Everyone's thrilled by that. You know, he floats down. Godzilla crumbles very into the uh, yes. It's a it is it is indeed a very happy ending, and it, it it's going to bizarrely get happier. It um, is. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, against all against all odds or reason, it's about to get happier because uh, the everyone comes ashore from the destroyers. We did it. Oh my gosh! Everyone's cheering. We were able to turn Godzilla into a, a crumply crumply ash bits. That's. That's great that that happened. Everyone's, you know, embracing and hugging us. Oh, we did it. Ooh. We're so happy. And as Koichi steps off the destroyer um, in his, uh, you know, he's, he's you know, bundled up. He's been in that cold water. He sees, uh, he sees Sumiko there and Akiko as well. And she hands him uh, that telegram that she got uh, while he was gone. Oh my goodness, whatever could this mean? I don't know, maybe his Amazon delivery had arrived, or perhaps, mm -hmm. I don't know, a check bounced. Who knows, who knows what it could be? But I think, unfortunately, I knew be before we actually got the reveal. Uh, as, it, as it turns out, um, uh, uh, Nariko is alive and in the hospital, and he rushes off with Akiko to meet her in her hospital room. And we have our big reunion of our our happy family. Uh, uh, incorrect. It's actually just a shared psychosis from the events of Godzilla <laughs> that they all believe she's alive when she actually that's isn't. True. That, oh. That's true. Occam's razor dictates that must be what actually <laughs> happened. Yes, that is true. more plausible. That is, that is more, more plausible. Uh, a mass delusion is indeed more plausible. <laughs> um, um, she's got her arm in a sling and she's got a bandage on her head, but uh, otherwise. She's, she's a okay, fine. and they oh, embrace a weird, uh, like a weird bruise, a weird glowing black bruise on her neck. Yeah. Sequel oh, bait. Yeah. But, uh, when um, I saw that, I was like, "Oh, really? Like, what? <laughs> you know, like, why'd you do that?" Oh you, my you goodness, it, you know? Godzilla AIDS. Yeah. No. Well, I mean, so, the sequel bait goes way further than that on your neck as well. Yeah, right? but, uh, yeah <laughs> if that sequel bait wasn't enough, but uh, yeah, they, they embrace in the hospital room. We have the uh, the you know, the, 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 the lover and they embrace and we have the kid and Godzilla has been uh, eradicated and hooray, isn't this, is well, so was a, we were able to do it. I'm going to say like the, the, is your war finally over and, and giving yeah. him her, like that hit me hyper in the feels, even though I was like, you should be dead. It's the thing about it is to the movie that you could so blatantly have 
plot well, this, armor the, like this that, but it still a makes me like, further degree of separation with these with me sometimes because of the fact that this isn't this doesn't affect them as people or motivations, whatever. Everything's intact for them. It's that God came down and fucking placed you know, a hand in front of her and somehow prevent, you know what I mean? Like, I'm well, like, it's not would, her fault, it's not his fault, and both of them are behaving exactly as they would if all of this had happened yeah, the way yeah. that it did. So I was like, I was still very immersed and... Characters are totally intact. It's just that the the plot saves, I mean, it, definitely her, so... <laughs> she, yeah, but if, we get a happy ending, uh, but then we get our proper sequel bait. Um, yes. Of, uh, uh, as, the, as the little steaming hunk of what remains of Godzilla's body sinks into the depths of the ocean it begins to regenerate godzilla minus one yeah, yeah. Place, yeah. which so, uh, um at first glance this is a quote one might assume godzilla minus one is meant to denote a prequel as mentioned above, though the film isn't directly connected to any other Toho Godzilla film. Instead, the title is a reference to the tragic story the movie captures. In an interview with Forbes, Toho International President Koji Ueda stated, The concept is that Japan, which had already been devastated by the war, faces a new threat with Godzilla, bringing the country into the minus. Anyway, Godzilla Minus One is a, is a pretty good movie. Uh, it's, pre it's pretty good. I like yeah, it. I really like it. it. I like it a lot. I so think it's it is... Excellent. Um, I mean, it's quite frankly, I, I, it's the best Godzilla movie that I've ever seen, and I yeah. think it would be, it's going to be quite a challenge to top it, just because it's so good. Well, how much uh, do you remember of Roland Emmerich's one? The the Matthew Broderick one? Oh, yeah. Fish. Um, a decent yeah. amount. Jean Reno is in it. He's a <laughs> mercenary. Yeah, Jean uh, in it. Hank right. Azaria's in it. He almost gets crushed. Yep. Uh, there are stand-ins for uh, uh, Siskel and Ebert. They're pretty great. Everyone loves that. I remember a decent amount because I watched it a lot as a kid. There is a crazy amount of the Simpsons cast in that movie for some reason. <laughs> I don't know if Fringy knows well, that yeah, as a fun my fact. Nancy or not. Cartwright is, <laughs> yeah. uh, Nancy Cartwright's in it. Uh, who else is in it? Voice of Smithers and Burns. Uh, what's his oh. name? Harry Shearer? Yeah. He's in oh, it as well. He in it? Yeah, he's like a, ah. I don't know, a high level businessman I lawyer person. It. Because I remember that uh, there was an ad for, like, on, uh, on Channel 10 back in the day for, like, TV movies. And this was, you know, this was, this was back in the, uh, the early 2000s when uh, Channel 10 was playing The Simpsons every night at 6 o'clock. Uh, and they even had The Simpsons Hour, which was three days a week, an hour of The Simpsons. They, uh, they played a lot of Simpsons. And so part of their little ad talking about the film was... Oh my god, Nancy Cartwright, but, you know, she's in it. And then I watched the movie, and she's not in it that much. Oh yeah, she's <laughs> like, barely in it, yeah. You lied to me, Channel 10. <laughs> you fucking lied. You have yeah, plenty, plenty of Hank Azaria, yeah. though. He's in a bunch of it. Yeah, because he's in it again. Wow, three out of six, you know? I don't remember shit about that movie. I just remember that she wasn't in it much at all. Mm-hmm. Well, we'll have to check that out again because that's the only one that might have a chance oh, of dethroning this that's one. Gotta you know? be part of the, uh, mm. That's got to be part of the arc. Because what you always hear Godzilla is that the design of Godzilla in that movie is everyone's favorite. It basically changed everything yeah. about you know designing oh, Godzilla. It was uh, became the new standard. So, well, I mean, the, the, I mean, the, this one's got it. How do you think that this film, now that it's come out and has gotten a very widely positive reception, how do you think this influences? actually the course of these western godzilla if movies. If there's anything we know to be true it's that they always learn the wrong lesson. So. <laughs> but what is yeah. the wrong lesson that they learn from well, uh, from this film? Who are we going from Set like in a different time period? I think are we doing Hollywood so first cuz what they they just they just don't know what the fuck's going on anymore. They're just we like need oh, um, We need a romance. We need a romance. Well so cuz that was yeah but there was a romance There was in a romance in this godzilla. one. Though. <laughs> yeah but it sucked balls. <laughs> no, I, I, so that's kind of the thing. To me, it's like, I don't see how you can misunderstand because everybody's pretty clear on what it is they like about this one, which is the characters. Right. Um, how, do you, how do you learn a bullshit lesson other than you got to write it well? How do, you, how do you learn an adverse lesson from that, you know? Um, um, set it in a different time period mm -hmm. and um, maybe have a war flashback and mm. maybe make sure the main character is a veteran. Uh, little things like that without knowing how to connect to anything. Um, maybe they would go hard with the, with the whole being vulnerable from the inside. 
So they just kind of go inside of Godzilla in a Hollywood movie. Ooh, maybe they shrink themselves what? down. <laughs> and just shrink fucking... down and go into Godzilla's mouth. <laughs> I think my worries would be more so at the idea of a sequel to this movie. I hope they wouldn't try to just repeat everything. As in, like, oh, well... There seems to be some level of, like, creative integrity that's happening at Toho and with the... Uh... <laughs> The, the director. You, you so can, hopefully... That's like the more classic form of bad sequels that we used to get would be if they made another one and he's like, okay, so people loved the Godzilla's allegory for this and then character going through this. It's like, we can kind of just roll him back a bit and make him go through similar things again. He'd be like, no. I no. guess the thing is, is that I could accept if they wanted to do a sequel, setting it a good while later so that the victory of this group of characters that I really like remains a victory for a while, so maybe it takes right. 20, 30 years That'd for be a good way to, do to it. get back to full strength so that you can, like, you can leave their story intact and then get a new set of heroes. Yeah. Hey, maybe you can bring back one maybe, of the old gang. Maybe in somewhere in the Philippines or something like that, you have a, like, a, a, a small Godzilla that hasn't regenerated all the way, and there's, like, a storm so they can't contact the outside, and this, this one island has to come up with some way to fight Godzilla on yeah. their own or Thing is, something like that. I don't know, I'd have to think We're getting it. a closely timed sequel considering she's got that stuff on her neck. Probably. With yeah. the same group of characters, which gets me a little bit... I don't know what the angle I'm is I'm always there. worried, um, yeah. Um, even with stuff like, you know, Andor Season 2 or House of the Dragon, stuff like that, I'm always worried when it keeps going because mm. I've just been... I guess I just, I've been battered and bruised. Well, this so is what I was... Do you remember the Chris Stuckman review where it said, like, you know, movies yeah. that are all filmed together, they're more destined to, like, fail? Because, and, and I was just thinking, like, well, you've you got to consider the angle of when you make something that doesn't have any audience response, you don't know what they liked the most and didn't like, and therefore cut out the things that you think, oh, that didn't work very well, when it's like a part of the cohesive whole, and then you like double down on things people liked, and then you have like the cake effect or whatever, or too much icing, you know, like... Uh, the you, cake uh, effect? <laughs> yeah, I've like... Heard um, of this before. If you eat too much cake, like you can feel like shit, because cake's uh, great, yeah. but you don't want to overeat on cake. You never heard that before? I've never heard of the cake effect. I mean, like, I, I mean, specifically the term, the cake effect, I've never heard of. I know, I know that you can get, like, a... I just meant, like, too much sugar an effect bad, made by cake, never... that's all. <laughs> yeah, I know, I was just, it just was f funny, just the phrase, the cake effect. <laughs> it just made me smile. Um, I really, really like this movie a lot. I'm glad that it happened. I'm glad it was a great mm. theater experience. Um... Broken and... record, but it is far and away better than the fucking Western Godzilla films, and oh, hopefully this absolutely. thing puts to rest the really stupid idea that nobody is interested in watching a Godzilla film with human characters, and that that needs to get out of the way, mm. just so that you can have the Godzilla fight, like many people were saying about Godzilla King of the Monsters. I'm sorry that I keep having to bring it up, but it's like, <laughs> I remember, a lot of people were saying that shit. A lot of people were saying this good. is the kind of Godzilla film I'll be even more bold than you, Fringy. It's better than Godzilla X Kong. It's not even out yet. Oh, not what? Oh, wow. I have, That's a, I'm a precog, and I know That's this this sort of thing. I know it's going to happen, so uh, it'll be cool to be proven right about that, and I'll prove that I'm a precog. They will burn you on mm. the cross. Probably. You're right. I think, yeah. <laughs> I, well, it's just, I would hope that, um, but I don't know. I, I, because the thing that's kind of lame is the idea that someone would say, well, no, they have a different place. You know, you have the real story and then the bullshit movie um, as though you can't also have the movie. You can have the movie that is Godzilla and Kong having their big fucking fight and doing their cool, like, superhero shit. And you could still have a story with human characters that are interesting and whose stories are meaningfully tied to Godzilla and Kong. But I'm just not very, I'm not optimistic at all. I feel like that oh, one no. is going to come out. It's just going to be some bullshit. I think. I think this one having come out is really going to hurt that one now because people will be like, "Oh shit! Right, this oh. is what we get." <laughs> you can have like a real. You can have a story where, again, Godzilla is meaningfully integrated into the story of the characters whom you like, and the story has something to say beyond "Look, big lizard, ain't that something?" Yeah. If anything, the big lizard, even though obviously and is a central and important part of the story, it really is about the characters and the journey that they're going on and what Godzilla represents to them, rather than the you know Godzilla as a physical entity in the world. It's way more important that Godzilla is a representation of uh, Koichi's guilt um, and 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 the attitude that he takes towards the belief that he needs to destroy it by destroying himself, but then coming around through all of the characters that he interacts with who care about him, who all have a different outlook on the world, 
presenting him with a more positive, life-affirming path that he can take to ensure, to, to remind him that what is it you're fighting for? It's like, well, you're fighting for life, including your own. And that's a really cool, that's a really cool message. It's a cool theme. It really is, cool absolutely. Movie. Because so much mm. of our stories revolve around these concepts. You know, heroism and sacrifice and things of that nature, but a take like this, and coming from a Godzilla movie, is, I mean, like, wow. I'm glad we yeah. got it. Really cool. Uh, and it, Yeah, and uh, make sure, uh, is it still in theaters, or is it starting to end? Because uh, it, it had a very now. limited... Uh, I don't know how I mean, long, I, saw it, I have no idea. I saw idea. it yesterday in theaters, so I think here it's going to be as Yeah, because as... I saw it like a couple of weeks ago. Um, yeah. If you get the chance, go watch it. It's worth it. It's really good. Yeah. Yeah, this is an easy film to recommend. I wouldn't imagine easy yeah. recommendation. I would be I would be like stunned if somebody went to watch it and didn't enjoy it. Yeah, like if that you don't like this, you're me. wrong. Um, uh, well, so, no, it's just yeah. more so that um, this is a film that I don't. I just don't see somebody leaving it not being happy with I it. I can't imagine it, has, it would you know? literally Action, filter a single has... person who knows the title of it. If you know it's Godzilla and you still chose to see it, I don't know how you'd be disappointed. Well, yeah, you get all yeah. the Godzilla yeah. stuff that you want, and then you get like a right, proper, actual story in there as well. Mm hmm. A nice, emotionally riveting story with a lot of. Because we talked about it briefly, but the performances are great. Oh um, yeah, especially, absolutely. Uh, especially Koichi. It's a pretty challenging role. There's a lot of uh, very emotional moments in the film that uh, he portrays with a lot of conviction and intensity. Well, are, uh, are we done? Is it, yeah. What's <laughs> what, what, hap what happens now? Do we uh, do we leave? Do we? Everyone leave? say goodbye. Do I go home. Uh, oh, uh, good goodbye. Goodbye, everybody. Thanks for showing up. Toodle pip. We will see you bye. later. Bye. See you bye. later. Bye. Bye.